The Dark Side of Cupid Hyperdimensional Interferences in Love Relationships by Bernhard Gunter. In my article Spiritual Bypassing, Relationships in the Shadow I looked at basic relationships dynamics and what usually comes up for couples in terms of shadow projection. I shared my own experience and wrote about the necessity of psychological education and healing as well as the danger of spiritual bypassing when we use spiritual and esoteric concepts to bypass basic psychological work and avoid doing deeper work within ourselves. In that article I also mentioned this. HTTP colon slash slash veloverealitycom slash 2014 slash 11 slash 22 slash the hyphen dark hyphen side hyphen of hyphen cupid hyphen hyperdimensional hyphen interferences hyphen in hyphen love hyphen relationships. Readers of my blog know that there are forces affecting our planet, the hyperdimensional realm. There is the issue of genetic psychopathy, the question of the soul and that we are not all the same inside and not all of us have the ability to activate the higher centers. As mentioned before, these are very complex topics that need careful study and consideration. Then there are spirit attachments, which can alter personalities from subtle to very severe. There is also the possibility of higher density souls that have incarnated in this time and age with a certain mission profile, who have a very hard time adapting to this physical experience. Modern psychotherapy doesn't acknowledge the possibility of psychic attack and hyperdimensional forces working through us. Most people still have a very anthropocentric worldview. Anyone who tries to awaken from the hypnosis humanity is under will be met with resistance and attack which can come through our own minds or working through people close to us, draining us, distracting us, and sabotaging any attempt to escape the matrix. There are a thousand things which prevent a man from awakening, which keep him in the power of his dreams. In order to act consciously with the intention of awakening, it is necessary to know the nature of the forces which keep man in a state of sleep. First of all it must be realized that the sleep in which man exists is not normal but hypnotic sleep. Man is hypnotized and this hypnotic state is continually maintained and strengthened in him. One would think that there are forces for whom it is useful and profitable to keep man in a hypnotic state and prevent him from seeing the truth and understanding his position. G. I. Gurdjieff This blog will address these topics in more depth, especially hyperdimensional interference in love relationships, orchestrated relationships through alien entities, as well as psychic attacks and spirit attachments. It's a topic that has been on my mind for some years and wanted to write about it for a while. Having had these kind of experiences in my own life and having done more research into it I realize more and more how many people may actually dealing with these kind of attacks, set UPS, and interferences. This topic is way outside the mainstream and not even now fully acknowledged or understood in the alternative media and many popular conscious movements. Most often it is ridiculed, misunderstood, or denied like the topic of UFOs and alien abductions by people who haven't researched these topics in depth. I will refer to past blogs and films that have explored these fringe topics before. If you are not familiar with them I recommend reading slash watching them as well and also check out the resources and citations within them. There are also many hyperlinks to books and resources for further study. UFOs, Aliens, and the Question of Contact. Organic Portal Soulless Humans. Wanderers, Purpose, and Esoteric Work During This Time of Transition. Hyperdimensional Realities. There is more to our reality than our five senses can perceive. We are not God's ultimate creation, nor at the peak on the evolutionary ladder. Our reality is embedded in a complex system of unseen worlds and controlled by denizens of higher reality. The forces at work are not all good and we're not on top of the food chain. Food doesn't have to be physical and certain beings feed off of our emotions and energy, predominantly chaos, wars, distorted sexual energy, emotional turmoil, and fear, which they initiate and create working through us. Various ancient esoteric teachings talk about a hyperdimensional matrix control system, HMCS, each in their own way, that has influenced and controlled humanity for millennia. Don Juan in Castaneda's The Active Side of Infinity called it the topic of all topics, speaking of a cosmic predator that uses man as food. Man has a glowing coat of awareness which the predator eats, leaving just the bare minimum of consciousness stuff for man to remain physically alive. The predator milks man through arranging for constant trouble and crisis and senseless preoccupation, so as to generate flashes of awareness that it then proceeds to eat. Jeff refers to it in the tale of the evil magician and the concept of food for the moon. The Gnostics maintained that the earth and material creation in general were the product of an evil demiurge, chief of the Archons of Darkness. The Shaitans of the Sufis and the Jinn in Arabian mythology are supernatural creatures who inhabit an unseen world in dimensions beyond the visible universe and interfere with humanity. Boris Moraviev writes about the general law in his trilogy Gnosis which influences humanity and keeps it in its place. It takes tremendous effort, awareness, and sincere self-work to escape the general law and influences of the HMCS. The UFO phenomenon relates to it in more ways than usually acknowledged by many contemporary UFO researchers who have a very nuts and bolts approach to the idea of UFOs, aliens, and extraterrestrials. There is a paranormal characteristic that accompanies UFO sightings, alien abductions, and other high strangeness occurrences that should encourage us to look at this phenomena in a different way instead of the popular assumptions that UFOs are physical alien spaceships coming from other planets. 
When researching the topic of hyperdimensional realities it also puts into question the various disclosure and exopolitics proposals promoted by some UFO researchers. There is a lot of disinformation surrounding that topic and it is interesting to note that attempts to reveal the hyperdimensional aspect of our reality are often ignored, attacked, and ridiculed, even more so than the nuts and bolts scenario. However, in light of the ancient esoteric teachings it all makes sense, since the HMCS is trying to conceal exactly that, hyperdimensional realities and the beings inhabiting them who have influenced and controlled humanity for eons. If we look at the world from an informational point of view, and if we consider the many complex ways in which time and space might be structured, the old idea of space travel and interplanetary craft to which most technologists are still clinging appears not only obsolete, but ludicrous. Indeed, modern physics has already bypassed it, offering a very different interpretation of what an extraterrestrial system might look like. I believe there is a system around us that transcends time as it transcends space. The system may well be able to locate itself in outer space, but its manifestations are not spacecraft in the ordinary nuts and bolts sense. The UFOs are physical manifestations that cannot be understood apart from their psychic and symbolic reality. What we see in effect here is a control system which acts on humans and uses humans. Dr. Jacques Vallée The scope, frequency, and distribution of the sightings make the popular extraterrestrial, interplanetary, hypothesis completely untenable. Many flying saucers seem to be nothing more than a disguise for some hidden phenomenon. They are like Trojan horses descending into our forests and farm fields, promising salvation and offering us the splendor of some great super-civilization in the sky. Do the ultra-terrestrials really care about us? There is much disturbing evidence that they don't. They care only to the extent that we can fulfill our enigmatic use to them. The real UFO story must encompass all of the many manifestations being observed. It is a story of ghosts and phantoms and strange mental aberrations, of an invisible world which surrounds us and occasionally engulfs us, of prophets and prophecies, and gods and demons. It is a world of illusion and hallucination where the unreal seems very real, and where reality itself is distorted by strange forces which can seemingly manipulate space, time, and physical matter forces which are almost entirely beyond our powers of comprehension. Our skies have been filled with Trojan horses throughout history, and like the original Trojan horse, they seem to conceal hostile intent. This hostility theory is further supported by the fact that the objects choose, most often, to appear in forms which we can readily accept and explain to our own satisfaction ranging from dirigibles to meteors and conventional appearing airplanes. In other words, flying saucers are not at all what we have hoped they were. They are a part of something else. I call that something else Operation Trojan Horse. The real truth is that the UFO cultists have been played for suckers for years, not by the government, but by the phenomenon. John Keel, Operation Trojan Horse In the case of the idea of man being food for hyperdimensional beings, there is an enormous amount of both vertical and lateral corroboration of all kinds. So much so that, in fact, it is almost impossible to understand why it is not generally known. Clearly, there have been deliberate efforts to hide this fact. And, the fact that it is hidden may itself tell us something. The point is, when Don Juan and Gurdjieff and the Cassiopeians, and others, tell us that our religions, our social structure, our values, our beliefs about our spiritual nature and condition have been deliberately created to perpetuate the illusion that we are free, that we are, or can be, special and adored children of a loving God, that we are or can be co-creators with God, that we can do anything at all of a positive and powerful nature, we need to carefully examine this issue. But it is work to examine it objectively. It is hard work because it consists of long and difficult self-examination in order to be able to overcome the emotions that prevent us from discovering what illusions we are hanging on to, what illusions are preventing us from seeing and acting in such a way as to become free. As we continue to think in these terms, it becomes more and more apparent that this great work of the alchemists was essentially the process of becoming free of the matrix, described in alchemical and allegorical terms. This hyperdimensional world is all around us, yet we are unable to see it because it is beyond the range of our senses. All the objects of our world are very likely just our limited perceptions of what is happening in this total reality. Since those forces that create and maintain the matrix have so much to lose, they exert a great deal of energy to keep the matrix of lies and false beliefs in place. And doing it from a state of hyperdimensional reality enables them to work from a state of timelessness, so as to be able to produce all the perceived effects that support their agenda, the evil magician of Gurdjieff, the flyer of Castaneda, the shaitans of the Sufis. And the reality has been manipulated for so long that it seems natural. It has become a comfortable prison in which Stockholm Syndrome reigns supreme, and the inmates love their captors. Thus it is that we may find that our religious myths and rites are remnants of narratives a message in a bottle designed to explain these phenomena, and that the monotheistic versions, declaring a final end, or a judgment day of a final end, are merely distortions of the myth designed to establish a control system on our planet. These distortions are beneficial to those who seek power and wealth, who are under the control of archetypal forces of another realm of which our own reality is but a shadow or a reflection. Let me reiterate. I do not mean, here, to suggest that this other realm is astral or ephemeral or non-material. 
I am suggesting that it is an intermediate realm of paraphysical, hyperdimensional beings whose existence and nature has been carefully concealed from us for millennia for a reason that is not to our benefit. And as we have learned from Jesus, Gurdjieff, and the Gnostic Sufis, Castaneda, and the Cassiopeians, the rules of this world in which we live were set up and are controlled by this STS, service to self, hierarchy and have been for a very long time. Each and every time the revelation of this control system is attempted, the matrix goes into overdrive to destroy it. And it is clear that this is the present situation, it is in seeing the unseen that we become aware of higher levels of being, it is in ordinary human interactions that we experience the battles between the forces of STS, service to self, and STO, service to others. And it is most definitely this factor that the matrix control system vigorously attempts to conceal. In other words, we are not just talking about a petty dispute, we are talking about a battle of forces at other levels, manifesting as always in human dynamics. Laura Knight Jadchik, The Secret History of the World The Alien Love Bite Eve Lorgan Ma, is a UFO-slash-abduction researcher who started her work in the alien abduction field while earning her master's degree in counseling psychology in 1992. She specifies an anomalous trauma which is defined as traumatic events that are out of the normal range of human experience. These experiences may include alien abductions, near-death experiences, shamanic initiations, military abductions, my labs, mind control, spiritual warfare, demonic and psychic attacks, cult involvement, and narcissistic abuse. Alien Love Bite Cover 275 Lorgan has been expanding on the work of the late Dr. Carla Turner, who was a pioneer in alien abduction research. An abductee herself, Turner published three books, Into the Fringe, 1992, Taken, 1994, and Masquerade of Angels, 1994. Dr. Turner was the first person in the UFO community to point out the many anomalous experiences of abductees which many other researchers ignored or denied only focusing on a nuts and bolts approach of the abduction phenomenon. For many years it was assumed that these aliens just abduct people to examine them, creating a hybrid race, or even claiming that abductions are positive and the aliens help us evolve that way. Dr. Turner found out that there are very disturbing aspects of the abduction phenomena with aliens implanting false memories into abductees, hiding the truth of what actually had happened. The evidence in her meticulous research shows that aliens harvest from us in a number of ways, emotionally and energetically as well as physically. Dr. Turner's work is featured in our film UFOs, Aliens, and the Question of Contact and you can also read a review of her work here. Dr. Carla Turner died of cancer on January 10, 1996, after being threatened for her work. She was just 48. Since then, several other people involved in UFO investigation have also experienced threats followed by highly unusual cancers. Humans have a deep need to believe in the power of good. We need for the aliens to be a good force, since we feel so helpless in their presence. And we need for some superior force to offer us a hope of salvation, both personally and globally, when we consider the sorry state of the world. I think the aliens know this about us they know that we want and hope for them to be benevolent creatures and they use our desire for goodness to manipulate us. What better way to gain our cooperation than to tell us that the things they are doing are for our own good? And it becomes clear from these details that the beings who are doing such things can't be seen as spiritually enlightened, with the best interest of the human race in mind. Something else is going on, something far more painful and frightening, in many many abduction encounters. As to researchers who claim that the ETS are here to help us evolve some higher consciousness or that they are here for some other positive purpose saving our plant, promoting world peace, etc. I challenge those researchers to incorporate anomalous data into this view. Theories are starting places for research, not proven conclusions, and UFO researchers must be willing to expand and alter their pet theories according to the data they uncover. It would be wonderful if we could shape ET experiences into something positive but until the details of abduction encounters all the details are given serious consideration, I think it's dangerous to cling to theories that ignore data that will not fit. We owe it to ourselves to seek the whole truth. No matter what the truth ultimately proves to be, we have to go for it. I mean without it we're like children playing with shadows and we're ignorant and we're certainly unempowered to deal with and confront whatever the real entities are behind this masquerade. To take it all at face value is foolish. To take none of it at face value is ridiculous. Investigations into this field there cannot be anything more important for us to be doing right now than to dig past our wishes, dig past our fears and dig for objective reality and understanding. Dr. Carla Turner Eve Lorgan coined the term love bite as a situation where two abductees are being programmed by their alien handlers to engage in a love relationship and essentially fall in love with each other. In her book The Love Bite, Alien Interference in Human Love Relationships Lorgan explores the effects of the love bite which can range from simple breakups of platonic relationships, to violent divorces, and from puppy love to sudden urges to marry a complete stranger. Through several fascinating case histories, Lorgan demonstrates how the alien beings are orchestrating these relationships and dramas for their own agenda. Most often this happens with two individuals who live far away from each other, 
each being seated with the image of the partner they are supposed to be with. A strong longing to meet the other person, telepathic connections, mystical experiences, having dreams of each other and orchestrated synchronicities through the alien handlers eventually bring those two people together. The sense of having met one soulmate or twin flame is very strong. It seems like magic and straight out of a fairy tale, having found the one. Both feel like they have known each other for a long time, even assuming a past life connection. The sexual connection is also very strong with out of this world sex, creating an energetic bond and hormonal rush which imprints the idea that this is meant to happen even more. It is love at first sight and a love obsession follows. One or both partners may even leave their job, their spouse and family and move away just to be with the other person. Then, after a period of being together, one person all of a sudden switches off and becomes emotionally unavailable, leaving the other's person in a state of unrequited love. This results in intense emotional turmoil and suffering for the love-obsessed person who still feels very bonded to the person who suddenly switched off. Suicidal tendencies, mental and physical exhaustion or even illness are the result. This may switch back and forth as well, when the love-obsessed person all of a sudden turns off emotionally and the other person who previously shut down is being targeted with the love bite again and feels deeply attached to the other person, resulting in more emotional turmoil. I did not want to marry the person who became my first wife, yet I had no control over the decision. Before we were married, we were jointly abducted and subjected to severe programming. The results brought no happiness to either of us. We both starved for love and companionship, even though we tried with all our might to find them. My son was also one of their subjects, and is miserable and lost. He is an artistic person with so many unknowable fears that he is paralyzed. I know of abductees murdered by mutilations. Reports of which are suppressed immediately and completely, by cancers that no physician has ever seen before, and by madness that has led to suicide. In my opinion, these acts were not caused by brothers of any sort. Elton Turner, husband of Dr. Carla Turner. One of the reasons for this scenario of why the aliens orchestrate such love-bite relationships is to feed off the emotional turmoil created. This ties into the idea of the HMCS and that humanity is food for higher density slash hyperdimensional beings who play with humans like figures on a chessboard. Food doesn't necessarily mean physical substance, but consciousness is food for higher density beings. Our emotions and, and sexual energy, triggered through these manipulations, is what these entities are feeding off and it seems they are trying to keep us in a frequency prison through genetic and other forms of manipulation, like implanting certain religious and new age belief systems, so they can secure their food source. The alien abduction phenomenon is certainly not a psychological issue on part of the people being victims of it. It is not an illusion or mental disorder. It is very real and a sincere study into this topic shows this clearly. In order to fully grasp the topic of abductions, we need to let go of what we think is or is not possible while watching our conditioned mind which tries to explain away such experiences with basic cultural approved psychology or new age spirituality. It is very important to understand the high strangeness of the UFO and alien phenomena. People who haven't really looked into it carefully paint pictures too fast, asking how all this could be possible on such a grand scale without anyone really noticing. They don't realize that a lot of this is a non-physical phenomena, dealing with a higher intelligence life form that is able to pop in and out of 3D physicality, transcending time and space. They can insert thoughts, memories, emotions, create virtual realities and change appearances depending on the belief system of the abductee. This is further documented in Dr. Carla Turner's books Masquerade of Angels and Into the Fringe. We need to hold ourselves to facts in this field and I think that is extremely important. We should repeat that ten times a day as we go through the work in this area. The problem of course with the abduction phenomena, as with a lot of ufology, is that the nature of the alien activity is designed deliberately to keep us from having much in the way of concrete evidence. Designed that way. It is not an accident. Dr. Carla Turner Another disturbing factor that emerged from my research was that these beings, whether demons, vampires, or aliens, seem to have the ability to control our thoughts to a certain extent, our physical bodies, the weather, and even events in our lives. Many people reported that their abductors were benevolent beings, but when we consider all the factors of the big picture of the phenomena, it seems that such stories of benevolence may be misleading. Laura Nightjadchik, The High Strangeness of Dimensions, Densities, and the Process of Alien Abduction equals N. They can play any scenario to make the abductee feel as if it is a spiritual experience, hence many contacts claim these aliens being are benevolent despite the fact that abductions happen against their free will to begin with. As terrifying as this may all sound, we also have to understand that we are more powerful than we think we are. It's a spiritual war in our weapons to defend and protect ourselves our knowledge and awareness. In fact, the deception lies in these entities making us believe that we are powerless and that we can't do anything about it. I think we need to recognize that deceptions are employed at almost every level of this interaction to keep abductees from knowing about the actual events and the actual entities involved in these encounters. To me, maybe I'm just a suspicious sort, this implies that there is something they don't want us to know about and often what seems implied from the reports is that there is something within is, the humans, something of which we can be capable, 
something of resistance or altering of this scenario that the abductors absolutely do not want us to be aware of. They go to great lengths to program our thinking about our encounters with them, that we are subordinate, that we are helpless, or that we are dependent, or that we belong to them, the list goes on and on. And they go to a great deal of trouble to convince us in every way that they can that we can do nothing about controlling these situations. The good news is that in a number of cases in the past couple of years that hasn't proven to be true. Abductees are finding more and more specific instances in which they were able to resist the illusion suggestions in which they were able to say no to procedures and in fact when they have been able to break free of actual controls. This to me is a great step forward and I think it's going to be something growing. With any luck we're going to find abductees are realizing there are ways to change this entire pattern of activity. Dr. Carla Turner Dr. Carla Turner Dr. Carla Turner Besides feeding off the emotional slash sexual energy, there are also other reasons for the alien love bite scenario. This goes deeper into the topics of alien abductions, my labs, military abductions, MK Ultra, Project Monarch and the dark side of the UFO slash abduction phenomenon. It's impossible to cover all the aspects in depth in this blog. Eve Lorgan describes the symptomology of a love bite set up by the conditions below. There may be a variation of these presenting symptoms, depending on the individual and his or her background. Characteristics, signs, and symptoms of a love bite bonding setup. Multiple abduction histories. In most cases the person had numerous alien encounters and slash or UFO sightings. In a few cases the targeted love bite partner did not realize him slash herself to be an abductee. Memories of bonding scenarios in abductions, vivid dreams, or virtual reality scenarios. Some have described it as a stage managed dream where both partners are present in a bedroom scene set up, where both individuals are being given telepathic messages to initiate contact, either on a verbal level or more physical sexual level. Oftentimes either partner appears to be in a tranced out or drugged state. Other stage managed dreams and slash or abductions may have the partners in various situations as if they are being tested for their emotional compatibility or coerced into thinking that this person would make an ideal romantic mate. Supernatural events and synchronicities. Uncoincidental coincidences and psychic flashes concerning the targeted partner. Meeting the person seems to be set up in a supernatural way, such that the couple may believe their eventual union to be divinely arranged. A match made in heaven. A first meeting of the pre-bonded partner may set off a series of DJAVU memories, flashback memories of previous abductions or dream-related bondings. Some have even described it as a body memory of having made love to that person before. One or both partners have a strong sense of having known the person before, as if they knew them all their lives or a strong soul connection. Paranormal and supernatural phenomena increases during the love bite setup. This may include empathic and even telepathic communication between the love bite pair. Spontaneous remote viewing images and mutually shared dreams. Other oddities may include the physical sensation of the partner's touch or energy field when the other partner is thinking or fantasizing about them. This is known as telesthesia, and is often experienced in a sexual way oftentimes in an altered state of consciousness. These conditions may propel either person to find the other, an obsession to find the dream partner. Strong emotional, mental, and even psychic connections with the bonded partner such that it sets up the conditions and desire for them to meet one another. The connection can be so strong that they have described it as a soul immersion in their beloved or literally having their souls joined to one another. Another byproduct is the amplification of psychic abilities in both OR1 partner. Some my lab abductees reported that the reason for the bonding was to amplify their psychic abilities, such as remote viewing to be later used in a secret mission or mind-controlled ops. Love obsession. A need for one partner or the other to be with them to the point of becoming infatuated. This includes the need to meet the person, even if it is in secret, and having to hear the person's voice on the phone, sometimes calling the person daily or several times a day. Just hearing the targeted partner's voice may have a calming effect on the obsessed lover. Extreme anxiety may be felt if the obsessed person cannot hear that person's voice or see them somehow. The obsessed partner usually feels love at first sight and may lose all critical reasoning ability. Some have described it as having the compulsion to make sudden life decisions like moving away, changing jobs, getting divorced or going out of their way to do things for the targeted person. It has been compared to being under a love spell whenever the obsessed person hears their partner's voice. They may go to great lengths to please the person doing anything for them, even giving up their life for them. Switching off. One or the other partners becomes unplugged emotionally, leaving the other in a state of unrequited love. Usually the obsessed lover becomes painfully unrequited after the other partner loses interest, often right after abduction. It has been described as the psychic and emotional unplugging of the targeted partner. Unfortunately the obsessed lover still feels the strong psychic slash emotional connection, but the other switched off partner feels nothing, leaving the obsessed lover grieving. Or the conditions for the bonded lovers are such that it is impossible for them to consummate their strong love, such as both partners being married to others or living a great distance away. Emotional turmoil in the unrequited partner's life. These powerful emotions of love and grief may cause the person to be inspired with creative energy, so that they write poetry, music, or any other art form of creative inspiration. 
Conversely, the degree of emotional pain may throw the unrequited lover into suicidal tendencies, mental and physical exhaustion or illness. Profound mystical experiences may also be perceived during the time of increased emotional processing or periods of prayer. Increase in alien encounters during periods of high drama and emotional conflict. The alien encounters may also increase if the person gets involved in alternative sexual lifestyles or increased sexual activity especially if it's with the targeted love bite partner. Some have reported increases in reptilian activity with methamphetamine or crack cocaine abuse. Some abductees have reported the bonding experience to take place more than once, whereby they have been on both sides of the love bite, the obsessed unrequited end, or the non-unrequited end. When they are on the non-unrequited end, a platonic friendship may be engendered. Some heterosexuals have suddenly become obsessed with a homosexual where a drastic change in lifestyle occurs. There are variations to the love bite dramas, wherein, for example, two abductees are placed together perhaps for the purpose of having children together, and they may not go through all the stages in the above set of symptoms. Based on the number of love bite histories I have compiled, I have come to the conclusion that there are at least four reasons for these set UPS. Some of these may serve dual purposes. One for the aliens and the other for the cooperating human military or intelligence personnel involved with a particular abductee. In this instance, my labs, or a faction of MK Ultra operatives under the abduction programs. The four basic reasons behind love bite relationships are. One genetic bloodline study or perpetuation of a particular trait useful for the aliens and slash or military, intelligence or Illuminati related group. For example high psi and dissociative ability. Two emotional soul harvesting of energies siphoned off the abductee for aliens such as reptilians, dracos, or demonic powers accrued to human magicians. In cases where sexual manipulations are done, this sexual energy can be used in Montauk-type experiments for time travel or psi amplifications, or materializations. 3. Amplification of paranormal abilities such as telekinesis, telepathy, remote viewing and precognition through sexual and soul bonding of other psychic abductees. In this case you can call them my lab operatives. Some of these operatives may have monarch programming or the more sophisticated alien programming based on the fundamentals of monarch MK Ultra programming. Oftentimes programmers, who orchestrate the various missions for their highly trained operatives, will want to soul bond and sexually bond a pair. This serves to keep the twinned operatives loyal to one another, and increase their performance. For example, when two operatives are so bonded to one another, they can telepathically transmit large amounts of information to one another, sometimes during sexual activity. If they love one another, they will also die for one another, taking greater risks for the success of a dangerous mission. For distraction and neutralization of troublesome abductees, or researchers, who are either breaking programming, whistleblowing, or getting too close to the truth. This may present itself as an abductee client that comes into work with a researcher, where a love affair ensues. Then the relationship may be an emotional roller coaster, or create chaos in the researcher's life distracting him or her from useful research. Or a sleeper operative abductee starts coming to a support group, wreaking chaos wherever they go which may include a love bite set up with one of the members. It may result in dividing the support group, creating unnecessary enmity between abductees and researchers who could have shared insightful experiences. In these instances the setup serves to prevent useful information from reaching the public. The alien love bit scenario researched by Eve Lorgan relates only to love relationships between abductees. The question who is an abductee or not is not always easy to answer. There are the obvious abduction characteristics and symptoms which abduction researchers like Eve Lorgan, Carla Turner, David Jacobs, Barbara Bartholik, and others have identified over decades of research and working with abductees. Personally I've seen some UFOs here and there and even reptilian slash alien-like entities but nothing that would hint at a typical alien abduction, no abduction dreams, missing time, or any of that, well, as far as I'm aware of. I did have high strangeness situations in my life and what could be coined hyperdimensional interference in relationships as described above but nothing that I'm aware of hinting at an abduction. Having said that, many abductions are not that obvious and can only be retraced through hypnosis since the aliens seem to have an ability to mind control the abductee, erase memory, manipulate space and time, as well as implant certain thoughts, emotions, everything from bliss to indifference, and even false memories as opposed to what really went on in an abduction. This happens through the use of a hyperspace technology that makes our technology look like the Stone Age. Some abductions have been reported fully conscious without hypnosis and there are many similarities between the stories of thousands of reported abduction cases worldwide independently showing a rather disturbing picture. Since most abductions are not remembered consciously, some abduction researchers believe that there are millions of abductions worldwide of people who have not the slightest idea that they had been abducted. Sometimes people only remember much later in life that something like an abduction could have occurred earlier in life. Abductions can start as early as infancy and can occur till late in life. Some people have been abducted hundreds of times. Many abductees are living in fear, not knowing when the next taking will happen, not being able to talk about it for obvious ridicule in the public. Many need to even hide these experiences from their families and friends, afraid of or being shamed or called crazy slash mental. 
However, the most disturbing part is the complete denial of this issue, not only in the mainstream scientific community, but especially in many progressive truth and new age slash conscious movements. Most people have never researched this topic sincerely in depth. The topic of alien abductions is mostly treated as if it is non-existent or just laughed at and ridiculed. The Dark Side of Cupid Expanding on her work in The Love Bite, Eve Lorgan wrote a book called The Dark Side of Cupid Love Affairs, The Supernatural and Energy Vampirism in 2012, published by UFO historian Richard Dolan's Keyhole Publishing Company slash Richard Dolan Press. In this book she explores hyperdimensional interference in and setup of love relationships between people who are not necessarily abductees. I will be quoting extensively from her new book as well as sharing my own experiences in light of the dark side of Cupid. Dark side of Cupid. Rarely, if ever, is any attention placed on the supernatural within the context of human love relationships being orchestrated and interfered with. There are books about love relationships believed to be brought together by divine intervention and mystical tales of how Cupid's arrow magically brought together true soul mates. But it's generally within a positive framework of finding one's true love, twin flame, or soul mate. But what about love relationships that have the appearance of being a match made from heaven but instead end disastrously, as if a supernatural intelligence interlopes as Cupid? A counterfeit soul mate match. Could such a thing happen? The answer is yes and this is what I call the dark side of Cupid. Of all the anomalous experiences under investigation, those that stood out as being extraordinarily traumatic were those that involved love relationships whose onset appeared magical, as if an unseen force had been at work forging powerful psychic connections, only to cascade into a spiral of emotionally draining dramas. I examine unusual love relationships in which something magical seemed to happen. But, instead of becoming a delightful and fulfilling soul-mate experience, the person was either psychically drained or thrown into an emotionally manipulated, high-drama relationship that had the earmarks of supernatural interference. If I had not experienced this myself, or counseled so many others involving these types of love relationships, I would not have believed or even considered such an idea. But now I do. With the dark side of Cupid, my aim is to challenge the reader to enhance their awareness of the possibility of relationship interference, forged psychic connections and even soulmate counterfeiting. Finding one's soulmate and happiness in love requires emotional maturity and spiritual wisdom. We can retain the magic, wonder, and unity of true love, but to do so, we must be discerning. In my experience, awareness and wisdom had come with a price. This pearl of wisdom I offer to you, in the hope that others do not have to pay such a heavy price of pain and emotional suffering on their journey to find true love. The truth is, what we lack in awareness can and does hurt us. And so let us be wise in matters of love. Needless to say, the alien love bite hypothesis is not something easily proven, but it became the name and definition of a type of experience in which its victims felt as if a powerful love match seemed to be set up elsewhere by a supernatural puppet master pulling some very potent emotional strings. I want to address one issue before going further. Whenever I bring up this topic some people claim that there is always emotional drama in relationships at times in various degrees and people already tend to blame their partner, parents, and others for their problems. They claim that bringing up the idea of invisible beings causing relationships dramas and interfering with relationships gives people even more excuse to blame others and outside forces, not taking responsibility for their own problems and issues. For the most part this assessment is based on not understanding the topic of all topics in more depth. I also pointed out in my article Spiritual Bypassing, Relationships in the Shadow that is crucial to take responsibility for issues that come up in relationships, understanding shadow projection, childhood wounding narcissistic wounding and basic psychology in general where we play out unconscious parts of our father slash mother image we are not aware of or we try to get needs met from a partner which we didn't get as children from our parents. So basic psychological work and taking responsibility is absolutely needed and necessary. This is not about blaming but understanding that there is more to reality than we are aware of and have been told. However, what I didn't mention in my blog on relationships and the shadow, but have in other blogs and also in the film Love, Reality and the Time of Transition, is that not everything negative in the world or in our lives is a manifestation of our shadow material, nor do we attract everything with our thoughts slash emotions. As mentioned above, we are not the peak of God's creation and so special and holy that nothing other than ourselves would harm, control or manipulate us. It's actually quite anthropocentric to think that way. We don't do everything to ourselves. It's not about blaming but getting out of our self-centered view of reality and the universe. There are other forces that affect us more than most of us are aware of, independently from our own shadow material. There are limitations when looking at it all through the psychology of Jungian shadow projection even though it does contain a lot of truth and is very useful and important in our self-work and working on relationship issues. The learning never stops and humanity still has much to confront and learn about that may require a whole new understanding of reality. There is always more to learn and find out that requires an adjustment and new understanding, expanding our view and understanding of reality. It is what raising consciousness implies. People who are stuck in one idea or teaching and try to explain everything through it are building their own limited reality box. This relates to philosophy, spirituality, psychology, astrology, science, or any religion, 
east and west, where many experts in any of these systems are only looking through one lens, many of them distorted slash false to begin with, not realizing that this approach can easily lead to distortion and a tunnel vision. It can also become an egotistical point of pride preventing that person to admit to him slash herself that there is maybe more to the story which one hasn't considered before, especially when their career depends on it and they have an image to sell and live up to. Some people who contact me keep this part of their lives secret for years, often a decade or more. The alien love bite experience leaves its victims feeling bewildered, emotionally drained, and betrayed not only by their alien visitors, if they know themselves to be abductees, but by the unseen entities that magically arrange the love partnership. It is as if the aliens or whoever these cupid interlopers are leave their victims feeling so profoundly affected that words can barely describe the emotional and psychic pain must endure. Love bite experiences are largely disbelieved, even ridiculed by mainstream media as well as by most psychotherapists and medical professionals. Adding insult to injury, many of their peers within the truth-seeking and disclosure community often ostracize them, as ironic as it sounds. The alien love bite theory and the embarrassingly painful effects do not bode well for the popular ufological disclosure movement, exopolitics theories, and space brothers are here to save us mentality prevalent in the new age and UFO community. No. Not at all. Nor has it gained acceptance within mainstream psychology circles. This means that those who experience the trauma of alien abductions and the love bite drama are stranded between a rock and a hard place, isolated in a no-man's land where secrecy remains the rule rather than the exception. If disclosure of all things UFO, extraterrestrial, and related secrets ever happens, then the alien love bite and especially the dark side of Cupid must be part of this. In my view it may very well be the root driving force behind the ancient extraterrestrial star gods themselves and those powerful clandestine organizations who appear to serve them. I've studied countless relationship self-help books dealing with toxic relationships, trauma and addictions, emotional vampires, dangerous men, and psychopathology. And yet none of these books ever recognize or mention anything near to what I am seeing. None address the paranormal element of orchestration and interference in conjunction with being drained emotionally, in a powerfully connected love relationship that doesn't end well. While there is often a level of psychopathology present in one of the partners, such as addiction or narcissism, it does not explain other anomalous characteristics of the relationship. Psychic and emotional vampirism is a key feature, and yet the vampirism itself may be an indirect aspect of the relationship interference as opposed to being the sole fault of one partner, aka the energy vampire. In other words, the emotional draining effects of the relationship may be a result of one partner who acts as a portal or some sort of conduit for another entity, such as Dark Cupid. This Dark Cupid's job is to hijack the energetic component of the love relationship. In other words, the greater the emotional drama, the more energy for Cupid to feed upon. Based on having worked with many people over the years who shared their experiences, Lorgan has identified three indications of major hallmarks of a dark side of Cupid relationship. One magical slash paranormal elements such as omens, precognitions, and psychic linking. Two psychic draining, or vampirism, and slash or extreme emotional highs and lows. Three the emotional manipulation and slash or psychopathology factor. At least two of the three indicators have been present in all cases, mostly all three of them. She calls them the unholy triad of symptomatology of the dark side of Cupid. In the first category, magical and supernatural elements happen right before and during the love affair. Synchronicities, vivid slash precognitive dreams, feelings of deja vu usually occur. It seems as if it's meant to be. Synchronicity has been coined by Carl Jung as being an a causal connecting principle, that is a pattern of connection that is not explained by causality, or in other words, a meaningful coincidence. Many of us have experienced synchronicity in our personal lives not only related to love relationships. For the most part we feel that these synchronicities are positive in nature, as if the universe is helping to be in the right situation at the right time without expecting it, or we may come across just the right book or article which helps us to get more insight around a situation we are in. I have experienced these positive synchronicities many times. However, what most people don't know is that synchronicites can be orchestrated by higher dimensional alien beings that look initially positive but were a bait to get us into our certain situation out of our own free will for their own agenda. So while there can be definitely synchronicites that lead us to meet the right person without interference, there are orchestrated synchronicities in the love bite slash dark cupid scenario. These synchronicities target our wishful thinking, blind spots, wounds, which are different for each of us, in form of temptation or magical meeting with one's perceived soulmate but is in actuality a counterfeit soulmate slash twin flame as Lorgan called it. Finding one's true soulmate and happiness in love requires emotional maturity slash intelligence, awareness, discernment, and spiritual wisdom. The whole idea of a soulmate or twin flame has also become very distorted in new age circles. Speaking of using baits to get us into situations, which are not what we assume they are at first, out of our own free will for the alien's own agenda, it is important to understand what Michael Topper wrote below. This goes even beyond the love bite scenario but relates to the global matrix control system and hyperdimensional manipulation in general. This is drawn from a series of articles written by a man named Michael Topper, 
who uses the nom de plume Marshall Telemachus or even Mother Teresu and others. After producing a great deal of material, most of which was published by Val Valerian in his series of Matrix books, he sort of disappeared from the scene after being under serious attack from the forces he exposed. His body of work and released material is complex, and the complex language usage at times makes it almost inaccessible to the average reader. This seems to be intended, because it is hard work to read it. There is no free lunch in the universe. In this series, he gives away incredible secrets of reality, but you still have to work to get it. 1095092 underscore 1020260740793399 underscore 11327069706970 underscore n. In the higher densities, the name of the game is consciousness. This simply means that the higher densities of existence, whether positive or negative in orientation, all recognize that the business of all being and existence everywhere is always that of consciousness, becoming more and more aware. Awareness is related to density of consciousness, so to say. The STS, service to self, way of achieving density of consciousness is to gain weight by assimilation of other consciousness units. This is generally promoted as all is one and refers to evil as a rebellion or a fault or something that will ultimately be done away with. Sto, service to others, on the other hand sees gaining weight in a different way. It sees that an acknowledgement of the consciousness of other self is equal to its own consciousness, in spite of completely different manifestation of that being, is the way to network the consciousness so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The difference is that the Sto guys recognize consciousness as being an integrative activity of mutual networking and interdependence because they view all others as self, even if they are different, and therefore seek to help and assist because the other is self in an absolute internal sense. In this way, absolute consciousness or God is glorified by a marvelous diversity of being if you wish to put it in those terms. The negative guys, on the other hand, play the game in terms of domination, subjugation, and absorption of other consciousnesses into one. But, they too, understand that the rules of the game posit that in order for them to truly absorb into their being these other consciousnesses, that the other must choose to become part of their self-aggrandizement. An unwilling food is, in essence, not nutritious so to say. If the consciousness does not choose, it becomes a poison to the consciousness that seeks to eat it. And so they must promote oneness in a very particular way. Note that both sides acknowledge oneness, but in very different ways. So, we have to understand here that the true negative realm agenda is to eat consciousness. So, this actually prevents an overt takeover in literal, physical terms. If an invasion was detected, this would mean that the veil would be lifted and all would see the man behind the curtain and would be disgusted and turn away. Just as in the Wizard of Ounce, those ruby slippers have to be obtained very carefully. Gathering the essence is an art of great subtlety. The negative alien plan is, in its purest sense, stalking. The aim of stalking is to create a completely controlled artificial environment composed of thoroughly predictable human behaviors made predictable because they have been programmed to respond to cues of conditioning inculcated through centuries of lies and obfuscations presented in the form of religions and all of this revolves around a story that is actually untrue, and wholly misrepresentative of the real negative aim. For centuries these programming signals have been being set up either because of time travel capabilities, or because of actual historical presence. Various prophets or religious leaders have been influenced to preach or teach or prophesy philosophies designed to lay a foundation for later takeover possibly in our present time. When people begin to get wise, the negatives simply go back into the past, add something more to the soup to cover up the new awareness. This then act as a domino effect and influences our present. Time loops and all that. A lot of people think that the alien invasion scenario is a ruse concocted by the government to create the impression that there is a forming threat, thereby enabling the institution of a new world order. But. This idea is based on a misrepresentation of the process just described. The important thing to remember is this, there is not a unified conspiratorial activity going on here in the hierarchy of government. The divide and conquer effect is also manifest at this level and ensuits the alien purposes to AT. Such activity at all levels is consistent with their program of stalking, in which confusion and cross-purpose prevents a clear perception on the part of the stockies. Yet, at some deep level there may be a direct conspiratorial interaction between the secret government and the negative aliens but it is unlikely that any name of those involved would be recognized by anyone, no matter how in the know regarding the subject. These secret superiors are just that, secret. Any organization you can name, or about which you are aware, are merely outer circles. What is the designed objective of this stalking? It is twofold. First, the effect of stalking is sort of like stampeding a herd of cattle. Bit by bit, they are consolidated into a negative mode which consists of the idea of us vs them. Even though, on the surface, it may seem that this mode is positive or sto, i.e. save the world because it is wrong or flawed, or blighted with original sin or whatever, the very fact that it is formed in the dominator mode of perceiving salvation outside, means that it can more easily be taken over body, mind, and soul at a level that is unseen and unseeable. In other words, Satan can and most often does appear as an angel of light. 
It is only at the lower levels of the power structure that many still believe they are playing out the basic antagonism and self-protection roles. They believe that sending love and light to those in need is appropriate, without realizing that this activity is predicated upon a deep belief that there is something wrong, in error, in rebellion, and thus becomes again, us vs them. There is evidence that extensive implant technology may be used to ensure influenced obedience, yet, a degree of freedom must be conserved through the consciousness due to the essential fact that the valued commodity is consciousness. A totally drugged, surgically altered, and thoroughly programmed psyche is only good for robotic slave service, and this may also be going on also, by the way. It is in this understanding that we find our way out of the trap. It isn't easy, but it is a way. The primary object of negative stalking is to persuade through strongly influenced, but not robotic, behavior patterns, the free choice of the targeted consciousness to align with negative higher density existence. Because, in the long run, the object is the eating of functioning units of consciousness by the negative hierarchy, with free will intact. It is not good food otherwise. From the positive slash negative realms of higher densities by Michael Topper. The second category of the unholy trinity is about extreme emotional highs and lows as well as emotional draining that goes beyond normal relationship issues. One or both partners may be putting the other partner on a pedestal with ecstatic feelings and ego boosting episodes and suddenly be let down to an emotional low, from one day to the next. It literally feels like becoming crazy where no rational, balanced and grounded communication is possible to work things out. It can feel like the both partners speak a different language. One day they may be experiencing out of the world sex and a magical love connection, the next day triggers come up resulting in overblown reactions draining one or both partners to an extreme and the next day it's all love and bliss again and back and forth, creating a lot of emotional turmoil that serves as food for negatively oriented hyperdimensional beings. The third category is about emotional manipulation and the psychopathology element. One or both partners may display unusually controlling, manipulative, abusive or attention getting behaviors, such as narcissism or Jekyllhyde duality. One partner may also appear as if possessed as if something is working through him slash her with paranormal characteristics. It's important to keep in mind that these paranormal slash possession type characteristics are not always that obvious and certainly not like displayed in Hollywood horror movies. There are various degrees to it, from more subtle and covered to more obvious and overt, but the goal is the same, to create drama, eruptions, and emotional turmoil in order to feed off it or for other agendas of the aliens as mentioned before. The issues that come up for a couple in a dark side of Cupid relationship may have characteristics of BPD, borderline personality disorder, PTSD, bipolar disorder, narcissistic wounding or other personality disorders and psychological issues, however, as I'll talk about later on in more depth, these psychological disorders may just be the manifestation slash symptoms of a love bite. People who have no reference or understand the dark side of Cupid slash love bite scenario usually try to explain what is happening only through the framework of mainstream psychology when in fact something else may be going on. It's also important to see the whole picture of a possible love bite relationship, especially the paranormal aspect. This quote by LKJ mentioned above is important to keep in mind. We are not just talking about a petty dispute, we are talking about a battle of forces at other levels, manifesting as always in human dynamics. Eve Lorgan gives a general description of how a love bite slash dark side of Cupid love relationship usually looks like. Are you on the dark side of Cupid's hit list? When it feels like a match made in heaven. The meeting could be accidental, in an unusual place or situation for you. But somehow, something magically happens that creates an opportunity. Perhaps you feel a premonition, energetic feelings that seems to happen out of the blue. Then your eyes meet. There is a sense of familiarity, as if you already know this strange new person, perhaps from another place or time. Yet, you can't seem to place it. The locked gaze, the sensation of butterflies swirling in your stomach, the feeling of excitement, anxiety, and perhaps even danger all lurk inside you. You can barely contain the sense that something big is happening. Maybe he or she asks you something that was on your mind, just as you were going to speak it. Have we met before? You seem familiar. A few moments pass and maybe you experience a feeling of deja vu. Perhaps you recall a recent dream when you saw the face of your could-be lover. He or she is wearing the same color that appeared in your dream, or perhaps appears in a familiar scene. You now feel that the dream was some sort of divine precognitive foreshadowing. Your dream lover has come to life. Your senses feel heightened, more alive. Those zingy, tingly, warm, and fuzzy feelings in your body seem to be resonating with this other person. Did you just meet the one? Your soul mate? Is this a sign that this person is about to enter center stage in your life? You exchange phone numbers and email. Next time you meet, you talk about things that you thought no one would ever really share with you, much less understand. You seem to have so much in common. Perhaps the person is not normally your type, yet inexplicably you share a powerful connection. The erotic fantasies begin. Somehow they feel so much more real. Why is that? From deep inside, however, you feel a subtle hint of push-pull resistance. 
Your inner voice tries to check in with you, but you squash it like a bug. Your logical mind may question all this, but the lonely part of you can't stop wanting excitement, a rescue from that hopeless feeling that you'll never have true love and will always settle for less. You want to experience passion and love that you've never really known before. You fight both sides of yourself as if you've been split into two people. Confusion sets in, and you just can't stop thinking about that person. The love connection begins and Cupid's drama unfolds. A series of magical phone calls, texting, emailing, and meetings begin. Perhaps you are compelled to drive long distances or even go across the country to meet with your newfound lover-to-be. The energies of excitement build, and you can't stop thinking about him or her, and especially about when you can have more time together to really connect, touch, merge. You never felt such a powerful connection with someone, it's almost telepathic with supernatural overtones. You finish each other's sentences, buy similar things at the store, find yourself wearing the same colors, and even eating the same food when not in each other's presence, and at the same times. That first kiss sends electrical thrills that zip right down to your erogenous zones. It's almost like you've been zapped by Cupid's arrow. You kiss again, deeply. It happens so easily, so fast. Sex feels so natural and connected. You find yourself doing things you didn't do with other partners. You feel less inhibited and the creative juices flow. You take greater risks that may be out of character for you. You push away confusion and the inner red flag voice flailing to be heard because, you say to yourself, yes. I'm going to follow my heart. I want passion. Now the roller coaster drama begins, and your life turns upside down. He or she makes you feel on top of the world, desired, cherished, and important. Events seem magically to unfold as though a divine script were being written that has pierced through the wall of your lonely heart. You are on a blissful high. Yet it doesn't last. Something happens. At some point, where you once felt excitement and passion, you wonder why you begin to feel weak and a little drained. Maybe your partner reveals a dark side. Emotional manipulation starts to unveil. Is your partner deliberately manipulating you like an emotional vampire, or does it just seem like it? You don't want to believe it. The emotional crashing lows begin, and you start to feel that events are unfolding out of your control. Your partner's full attention and presence seem to be out of your reach, and your life becomes an endless chase of unconsummated love. Eventually, unrequited love pangs tear at your heart as you and your lover are buffeted about in one drama after another. In time, you become an emotional wreck. Confusion sets in and it seems as though every time you get near Cupid's lover, you become weaker. You feel sucked dry of your emotions, logic, and better sense. What happened? A lot of what Lorgan describes may sound like the typical phases of any relationship. The initial infatuation, emotional highs, projections, great sex, and all the hormones creating a rush of bliss and excitement. That is usually the romantic phase. Then reality kicks in and the shadow appears triggering childhood wounds and other issues that usually come up in any relationship. However, there is more to the story in a dark side of Cupid slash love bite relationship. Here is the basic dark side of Cupid questionnaire that Lorgan asks her clients. Do these main characteristics seem familiar to you? One magical and supernatural elements that preceded or occurred during the love affair. Things such as synchronicities, precognitive dreams, insights, vivid dreams, and feelings of deja vu. Paranormal activity. Love match seems to have been influenced from the beyond, as if it was meant to be. A very strong connection with the person. Why slash n? Two emotional highs and crashing lows, emotional and psychic draining. You may have been perceived on a pedestal with ecstatic feelings, then were suddenly let down to an emotional low, either by the partner or through events out of your control. Lots of drama. Why slash n? Three emotional manipulation and the psychopathology element. Did your partner have unusually controlling, manipulative or abusive and attention getting behaviors such as a. Histrionic, drama king slash queen, endless talking, chatter, attention seeker. Why slash n? B. Addictive and compulsive, drugs, alcohol, sex, work, sports. Y slash N. C. Controlling, jealous, emotional manipulator, passive aggressive. Y slash N. D. Narcissistic, lack of empathy, exaggerated sense of entitlement, praise seeking, needs constant attention and slash or superiority complex. Y slash N. E. Passive, yes but whiner victim, very needy. Y slash N. F. Extreme Narcissist, or Dr. Jekyll slash Mr. Hyde Duality, Demonic Possession, or Hosting. Supernatural Qualities, like Black Magic, Hypnotic Control of Victim as if you are under a spell. Y slash N. Personal Questions Category. Category 1, Magical and Paranormal Elements. A. What kinds of things happened before or in the initial phases of the relationship that led you to believe that this was perhaps out of the ordinary? Things such as vivid dreams, astral connecting with the partner, synchronicities, a stronger psychic link with the partner than was normally experienced with anyone, etc. 
explain. B. Did the relationship seem to be manipulated or orchestrated from unseen intelligences, and make you feel that you were under a spell? C. How did you feel the connection, did you have a greater degree of passion, and did you feel this to be more than just sexual? Did your heart area, solar plexus, or other areas feel distinctly different? Describe. D. Did you experience a heightened degree of psychic sensitivity or empathy with your partner or other people during this love drama? E. Did you or your partner witness any ghostly presences, spirits, or alien entities during or immediately preceding the love relationship? F. Did you or your partner experience a love obsession that was not characteristic for you or them? Category 2. Emotional highs, lows, drama, emotional draining. A. Were you emotionally drained after a certain point, and did this affect you physically, like getting ill or losing a lot of weight? B. Did events happen out of your control that kept you both from being able to meet or consummate the relationship or do more things together? C. Did you find yourself thinking or doing things that was out of character for you when around this partner or even afterwards? Taking greater risks, for example. D. Did you or your partner suddenly become emotionally switched off and uninterested for no apparent reason or was there a reason if this happened? E. How long did it take you to heal and get over this love relationship? How long did the relationship last? Category 3. Emotional Manipulation and the Psychopathology Element A. Do you believe your partner was a psychopath, which demon-influenced or possibly a possessed individual. B. What kinds of behaviors did your partner do that you felt were, emotionally manipulative, inflicting guilt, shame or that you are less than or bad explain with an example. Controlling or abusive. Overt or passive-aggressive. Explain a typical scene or interaction. I want to say a little more about the hallmarks of the dark side of Cupid experience. When examined from afar, the beginnings of the love drama appear positive, and perhaps within the normal range of human experience. But when delving deeper into the dynamics of the love match, I noticed that the experience held a greater degree of a magical reality. Overtones of extrasensory perception and paranormal elements manifested in ways that had not normally been experienced in the lover's lives or in those of most people. Obviously there are many variations and degrees of the symptoms listed and not all have to apply, but if the majority fits then it may indeed be a dark side of Cupid encounter. It all depends on each individual and his slash her personal history as well. As said above, this is just a basic questionnaire. It takes deeper introspection, recapitulation, and objectivity to see all the red flags which people tend to rationalize away, as I did as well in my experiences at first. Most often this is not possible until after the relationship is over and one is in a more balanced emotional state to understand what actually had happened. There are various vulnerability factors, as Lorgan calls them, which make people more likely to become a victim of the dark cupid, although it still can happen to anyone as she pointed out as well. The most common two factors of possibly being a target for a love bite or dark side of Cupid are engagement in alternative media, research, conspiracy, and paranormal and spirituality being 99% of the case studies by Eve Lorgan and involvement in caretaking and nurturing professions, 71%. Engagement in alternative media, research, conspiracy, and paranormal and spirituality. All but one respondent who filled out my dark side of Cupid questionnaire was a follower of alternative media, paranormal, conspiracy, and slash or spirituality interests. These were individuals who were actively engaged in becoming aware of what is going on in the world and cosmos, including higher consciousness explorations. These people tended to do a lot of internet research and radio talk show involvement, and had interests in spirituality and the paranormal. All persons were intelligent, outside-the-box thinkers, who challenged the status quo of mainstream media, education, politics, and religion. Some were whistleblowers. Many of them had psychic abilities and a greater awareness on social and esoteric levels. One may ask. How can this be a vulnerability factor? If lack of awareness were a major vulnerability factor why would aware people be so vulnerable? Involvement in caretaking and nurturing professions Over two-thirds of the dark side of Cupid cases involved people in careers such as teaching, counseling, nursing, and psychic intuitive work. These individuals have a tendency for a high empathy factor, and are more giving in nature. As a result, they sometimes have greater difficulty setting firmer boundaries with user and taker, partners, friends, and co-workers. Maybe now is a good moment to share some of my experiences, especially since I fit right into those two main categories. My quest for truth, questioning the world we live in and getting interested in the paranormal, conspiracies, spirituality and other topics outside the box of the status started about 20 years ago. Eight years ago I started to write about these topics on my blog and social media outlets. Around that time I also started working full-time as a self-employed bodyworker slash massage therapist. Before that my relationships were pretty normal even if they didn't work out. No high emotional drama, no paranormal occurrences and no over-the-top magical synchronicities. Even in retrospect I don't see anything that could have hinted at a dark side of Cupid love relationship. I haven't had many relationships and have been more single in my life than being in relationship. I never felt that I had fear of intimacy or fear of love relationships in general. 
Back then I was just very involved and focused on my band in my musician years and also the research I got into. So a couple of relationships came and went but without any drama, paranormal activity, lingering issues, or hard time to let go. All that changed once I got deeper into esoteric knowledge and especially into the topic of all topics, the UFO phenomenon, abductions, and the dark side of the alien topic, the hyperdimensional control and manipulation of humanity, which manifests itself in different ways throughout the, secret, history of the world based on the cultural context. This underlying hyperdimensional reality that is behind our history and how it extrudes itself into the historical timeline, and how you can observe these long historical events and see the movement of that hyperdimensional energy through the actions of human beings, through historical cycles, through the behavior of groups of people, through the manipulations. Things emerge, you know. Laura Nightjadchik. It all intensified around the time I was making the film UFOs, Aliens, and the question of contact with my friend Umberto Braga. During the making of the film we both experienced high strangeness events in our lives. Umberto started to get involved in a relationship that also had symptoms of love bite. He started to have dreams about abductions and even having has abduction-like experiences, waking up in the opposite direction of how he felt asleep with strange body marks, cuts, and scratches on his body. His relationship turned into a spiral downward with a lot of irrational behavior and emotional drama by the girl he was involved in. One day she literally just disappeared without a word or closure. It took him a long time to get over it. While we were making the film I also had a new female client coming to my studio for a massage session. It was someone I never met before and who had no idea about my research and topics I'm interested in besides bodywork. I usually check in with my clients before the session, asking how they are feeling, what is going in their lives and also inquire about their dreams to get a better assessment of where the person is at and how their emotional life and stress affects their body. The dream and experience this particular woman shared was a textbook alien abduction scenario. She told me that she had a dream in which a small creature appeared at her bed. She then woke up and felt a strange presence. She looked out of the window and saw a UFO taking off right behind her house. She told me that she had no idea what that meant and she also had no background knowledge or any interest in the topic of UFOs. The description of the entity she encountered was very similar to the typical grey alien creature. Obviously I had to be very external considerate and didn't mention anything about my research into this topic. After all I didn't know her at all and didn't want to freak her out. I just gave her some bodywork to help her get grounded since she also was going through a lot in her life, especially with regards to relationships. A week later she came again for another session. This time she shared more of her family history, telling me that her whole family, even her grandparents had strange encounters with aliens and UFO sightings. It seems to have been running in her family which is another big clue. Then she shared with me another dream she had after the first bodywork session. In this dream this alien being appeared again and told her that she had been reprogrammed. She had no idea what that meant and neither did I. Since we had established a good rapport and trust, I then suggested to her to look into UFO literature and see if she can find some similarities to her experiences. I also suggested to do more bodywork sessions to help her connect with her body more since the work did help her. She was out of touch with her body and seemed to disassociate a lot. She agreed and was looking forward to continue with the sessions. However, after that second session I never saw her or heard of her again. I have no idea why. Was she too freaked out about what she experienced and did it increase since she met me? Or was she reprogrammed to not engage with me anymore in order not to reveal to her what seems to be going on with her? I don't know. It all intensified when we released the UFO documentary in 2011. One of the UFO researchers we featured in our film, who liked it and thanked us for making it, contacted us shortly after the release telling us, just be aware that you will attract attack for putting this information out. Little did I know how the attack would come about and how it already had been set up. Since 2006, when I started to write about all that on my blog, I've been in three relationships, each of them showing many symptoms of a love bite slash dark side of Cupid love relationship, to varying degrees, as I see now in retrospect. During the making of the UFO documentary I was involved in an on and off long distance relationship with a woman who turned out to be an abductee, coming from a military family. Her parents and grandparents also had abduction like experiences. It was a very complicated relationship. One part of me was very infatuated with her but another part knew that something was off and I shouldn't engage with her. She visited me periodically and we had a very strong sexual connection. But soon a lot of emotional drama came up which drained me tremendously but I couldn't let go. Even when she was gone I felt the strange but strong pull to see her, almost obsessive. We talked a lot over the phone and during this time she also had an encounter with a reptilian entity in the middle of the night, as she told me. After we released the UFO documentary on YouTube in 2011, things got worse with her and the relationships blew up eventually. It was obvious that this was not going to work but yet I had such a hard time of letting go as if there were strong invisible psychic slash emotional cords. It took me several months to get over it which seemed way too long, considering that the relationship wasn't that long and we only saw each other of a total of one month based on all the visits. I was very emotionally drained and exhausted. 
My next relationship after that one lasted longer, about 1.5 years. I met this girl at a workshop I took at East Salem and felt intensely drawn to her. There was also a strong sense that I knew her. She seemed very familiar. Strange synchronicites also seemed to confirm that we were meant to be together. At the beginning it was intensely sensual and sexual. Both of us never experienced such a connection. I literally thought and felt I had met the one. There was no doubt in my mind, although there were red flags which I conveniently ignored or rationalized away, more on the topic of red flags later. After only two months of knowing each other she moved in with me which I even suggested to her. Looking back I can only shake my head at what I was thinking. Things started off nice and beautiful but soon it went downhill. A lot of issues and childhood wounds came up for me during this time as well as I wrote about in spiritual bypassing, relationships and the shadow. She had intense periods of anger outbreaks and breakdowns that left me stunned, emotionally drained, and extremely confused. After our breakup we even tried to work things out through therapy but it got worse. At one point she started to shame me about my work and what I do to the point that I went into a downward spiral of deep depression and even suicidal thoughts. I literally contemplated suicide and without the support of my good friends I would have not made it through it all. I even thought at one point to delete all the videos we made in this blog. I saw no sense of going on. The emotional pain was too much to bear. I also had a lot of pain in my solar plexus. It took me six months to recover from that and couldn't continue my work during that time, not being able to read or write. I even had to take time off from doing bodywork for a bit since I couldn't help others in the state I was in. Cupid's Treasure by Verna Catalatola. Cupid's Treasure by Verna Catalatola. You'd think that by now I would have had learned my lessons, but no, a year and a half later I got involved in another relationship that only lasted for a couple of months but had the love bite slash dark side of Cupid written all over even more. I want to make clear that none of what happened with this or the other relationships I mentioned is anyone's fault, as Eve Lorgan stresses as well. In retrospect it felt as if we were being pawns on a chessboard. So keep in mind that this is not about blame, nor about demonizing or anything personal as I share what happened which are the symptoms slash manifestations of the dark side of Cupid working through us for the most part, played like puppets on strings. I met this girl through Facebook, seemingly interested in the same things as I am. She was aware of my work and the films I had made since they came out, sharing them with many of her friends. One thing leads to the next and we started Skyping. Right away the first thing I notice is the strong sexual energy between us and so did she. I also noticed how she had a hard time expressing herself, and there wasn't really a, a strong intellectual connection. But I ignored this since I felt very drawn to her for some reason and so did she to me. We started to flirt and even exchanged all kinds of cute emoticons on Facebook which I never did before. It was bizarre because I usually never flirt let alone send emoticons. It was totally out of my character. I found myself in a strong romantic bliss with all the fuzziness and butterflies. I told my friend Umberto all this and he did see some red flags from the get-go as has been confirmed by other friends as well later on, but again I ignored that too, distracted by appearance. After only a couple of weeks we decided to meet each other and she was very determined to come here. I was looking forward to it too. We also had the idea of doing a music slash art project together but underneath all that something else was happening. There were also a lot of synchronicities that seemed to show that this was meant to happen. We had dreams of each other, finished each other's sentences as if we were psychically linked. It was very magical. She booked a flight and came to visit me. I remember on my way to the airport feeling that something is not right about this. This happened way too fast, but again I ignored all the red flags and deeper hunches I got. After having not been with a woman for a year and a half I was also just looking forward to some female company. The first night she was here we had sex right away and after the third day of having sex daily I got sick badly, coming down with fever and in a severe sore throat. Keep in mind that I haven't gotten sick in five years at that point and I'm a healthy person. Not even five days of her being at my place, still recovering from my illness, she started to complain, why I don't compliment her more often or showed more physical affection. Since she had read my work I assumed that she understood relationship work and how we expect unfulfilled childhood needs from a partner at times. So I saw this in a positive light and opportunity to address these issues. However, communicating about all this reasonably was not possible. She got triggered a lot and had many romantic expectations. She had an extremely hard to time to express herself and there were severe communication issues I never experienced before. She then also told me more about her abusive upbringing which explained a lot, too, and we came to an understanding here and there where she was able to see how a lot of it related to her childhood and we switched back into romance mode, enjoying our time together. But then it switched again as if everything we talked about was forgotten. Only a week later she complained why I don't respond to her sexual cues and why we don't have sex more often. We had sex almost every day at first and after I got well again maybe three four times a week but it was still not enough for her. She started to compare me with past lovers who she claimed were more sexual and physically affectionate than me. However, in the end I didn't even care about sex, I just wanted to get to know her and establish a strong platonic connection, as I told her. 
she basically started to shame me about my sexuality, claiming that she's just very sexual and proud of her sexuality, and that I just don't have a strong libido. Some of her sexual desires didn't feel right to me, seemingly enjoying pain and all kinds of kinks I didn't feel comfortable with, again comparing me with her past lovers who engaged in these kind of things and that she just has to get used to me that I'm not into that and not as sexual. Sex for me is beyond any kinks and fetishes anyway. It's all about the energetic and emotional connection. Keep in mind that all this started to happen only one week into us ever being together. Naturally I got turned off to engage sexually at one point because there was no true intimacy in terms of emotional connection, nor a deeper platonic connection and communication. The focus on sex and physical affection and her romantic expectations around that were overriding everything else. It was deeply confusing. One day she was all over me and I over her and we were in some sort of romantic bliss, the next day she shut down triggered by something I didn't do, or say something as she expected me to, and back and forth. Whenever I was inquiring, she stonewalled me for the most part and somehow expected me to read her mind. I inquired and asked questions but it was clear that she just disassociated. However, at the same time I felt a lot for her, believing I was in love. I started to feel very drained with a lot of body pain, especially in my solar plexus. Going to work and doing bodywork became very difficult for me. She also started to feel drained. Whenever I tried to talk about all that and apply basic psychology, she got triggered a lot and took it personally. When talking to her and trying to explain myself I saw in her eyes that she had no understanding what I was talking about and couldn't take it in at all. She seemed to disassociate a lot. I tried to approach it all with empathy and compassion the best I could. Having said that, I also didn't always handle these situations well. I was so confused and literally thought I was going crazy, so at times I became overbearing and we got into arguments. My childhood wounds of not being good enough got triggered as well. I knew that stuff would come up eventually as they always do in relationships but I did not expect for all this to come up only one week after meeting for the first time, not at all. I realized my mistake of connecting so fast and intensely with someone I didn't really know, however, there was no escape since she was here for four weeks. We did have good times as well and fun as well, but the emotional roller coaster of extreme highs and lows was completely out of the ordinary which I never experienced before in that short amount of time. Feeling shame and guilt around not satisfying her enough sexually, I engaged sexually more with her than I felt comfortable with. There were other red flags which I ignored. I knew even before she came here that she had been working as an escort and even engaged in prostitution since a young teenager on and off, making very good money off it. She had regular clients who sponsor her art slash music career as she called it and she also worked here and there at a massage parlor which wasn't really about massage. I rationalized all that away since she assured me that she doesn't do that work very often, only when she needs to make money and she got paid very well so she didn't have to work for many months in between. When she was at my place, she also considered of moving here and working as a stripper. When I expressed my concerns around that she get very triggered. Yes, I know, it sounds insane that I let these huge red flags just pass by. From the outside it's easy to see it all but when you are tagged slash set up by a love bite, reason goes out of the window. The intense emotional pull to be with her was overriding it all and I got lost in the romantic bliss we had. She justified her line of work by claiming that it didn't affect her. I then took it on me to just accept her and her line of work in an attempt to be open-minded since she claimed that she wants slash needs a partner who can accept that because her work finances her lifestyle she doesn't want to change, giving her money and time to travel and do her art slash music. It was utterly confusing because it made no sense that someone who claims to be aware of the topic of all topics and is seemingly interested in truth and sincere self-work doesn't understand that this kind of work is obviously a huge feeding ground for these beings in a free supermarket for spirit attachments. It is very important to not participate in the normalization of sexual behaviors that are not based in mutual respect and deep reverence. This may sound prudish but I do think human sexuality is powerful and threatening to the dark forces and they use normalizing sexual deviance and loose sexual behaviors to destroy people and to prevent the true spiritual potential of human sexually from being realized and enjoyed. There is no comparison when sacred sexuality is honored, realized, and or known. Lower forms of sexuality are then obviously repulsive, low, and degrading to every person involved. Having the good sense to set appropriate boundaries, finding and addressing our blind spots and past traumas that create unconscious reactions and developing the capacity for highly evolved skills of discernment is of extraordinary importance. If we have not addressed our own blind spots and unconscious triggers or do not have a clear sense of what is really going on, this can be one of the easiest ways that narcissists and entities can use to take and misuse our energy. Eve Lorgan, Spiritual Warfare, and the Human Soul Reptilian Hosting and Strip Clubs The last week of her stay I got sick again and was emotionally very drained. Another red flag was the fact that she had been suffering from sleep paralysis and she also shared that she had high strangeness experiences in her life with alien entities. While she was here, she had a couple of episodes of sleep paralysis, the most disturbing one was shortly before she left. She woke up in the middle of the night after being in sleep paralysis, being afraid. I woke up too and held her in my arms, trying to calm her down, 
telling her that I'm here and all is good. As I laid down again next to her, all of a sudden I felt this very strong sexual energy coming from her. Although I was tired I got very turned on and started to have sex with her. After it was over I felt right away that this shouldn't have happened because I felt very animated during the act, not being myself at all. Incubus She said that she didn't feel sexual at all and was surprised that I came on to her. She also felt that it was off and shouldn't have happened but also engaged with me assuming that I just wanted to have sex. She also shared more about her sleep paralysis. When she was in it she saw two entities, one my body and one on her body as we were laying in bed. I wasn't aware of any of that. Connecting all the dots, I tried to bring up the topic of spirit attachments and even the love bite scenario but it triggered her immensely taking it all way too personal. It was clear to me that something was working through her which affected me as well. Considering her sexual history, not only her line of work but also the many past lovers she had and having started to have sex at a very young age, as she shared with me, it all made sense. She also had a history of using speed, amphetamines, which helped her when making music so she claimed. However, she kept justifying herself, her sexuality and affectionate nature and there was no way of talking about all that and exploring it objectively. I assumed she was aware of all these topics, considering she liked my work so much, where I wrote about all these subjects, and that was actually the very main reason why she wanted to connect with me and come here, as she said. A couple of days after that incident she flew back home and we left on a good note. We then tried to work through all the issues that have been coming up over long distance. It was a mess. I was very confused. Part of me knew that this needed to stop and we need to stop engaging. Another part of me wanted to work it out so desperately and I felt a strong emotional attachment to her. The communication issues became worse. It felt like we were talking in different languages. I was also not handling the situation well at times and kept writing to her although she told me that she needed space on her own. My need for closure and letting go, contradicted by a desire to work things out and my emotional distress around all that was very confusing, for both me and her. I was hurting a lot but the grief and emotional pain was too overblown compared to any other breakup after such short period of time. I was unable to let go and the pain in my solar plexus increased, even manifesting in a muscle spasm in that area that lasted for weeks and gave me a great deal of pain as well. I wasn't able to function, not able to do my work. I felt just like after the breakup from my last relationship. That's also when I realized that there is more going on than just basic psychological stuff or relationship issues. It was so extreme, feeling drained and paralyzed. The emotional turmoil got the best of me. The intense pain in my solar plexus was the same pain I experienced in the other two relationships as well and never experienced in any other relationships. In most of the case studies by Eve Lorgan, one or both partners also experienced uncomfortable sensations and pain in the solar plexus area. Physical complaints such as solar plexus sensations and exhaustion are characteristic of psychic vampirism, as opposed to simple emotional vampirism. Finally after a couple of months of back and forth she realized more and more how her childhood issues were coming through resulting in expectations that no man can fulfill. She also realized that her line of work is not healthy for her and she's now actively engaged in working on herself and getting out the work she was in since a teenager and she also stopped doing speed. She also was able to see how our relationship had strong aspects of a dark side of Cupid scenario. We left it off at that and stopped communicating altogether which seems the best for both of us. It's interesting, as soon as we both truly acknowledged what actually happened in light of the dark side of Cupid without taking things personal, it was easier to let go and the pain in my solar plexus diminished although it still took a couple of weeks for it to pass completely. However, while I was writing this blog I started to feel pain in my solar plexus again and felt drained at times, not being able to focus as if something didn't want me to write all this. However, the more I pushed through it with the help of good supporting friends who gave me good feedback and kept encouraging me it did get better. I still may be dealing with something that attached itself to my aura or they may be psychic attacks. Taking extra care of myself and especially getting into my body through yoga and bodywork has helped a lot. I'm sharing all this very personal stuff so others can learn from it as well and maybe relate to. There are many other ways the dark side of Cupid can play out in relationships depending on each person. I also want to make clear that this is not about blame. Most, if not all happened outside our awareness at first. So it's important to look at it all objectively and not making it a personal issue as in who is to blame or who was right or wrong. This is also not a gender issue. We need objective self-reflection when dealing with relationships in general, being able to see and own our blind spots. Interestingly, all three women I shared my experiences about here were very sexual, showing narcissistic behavior, very attention-seeking, needed to be praised, complimented a lot and needing a lot of physical slash sexual attention that were not normal in the sense of healthy adult needs or a more mature expression of affection. They were lacking emotional regulation, having a Dr. Jekyll slash Mr. Hyde duality, completely switching off emotionally at times. A lot of stonewalling too. The contrast to all that which made it all very confusing was the love obsession, the sexual slash romantic bliss, high and joyful times and seemingly true love. 
However, as Eve Lorgan said, when examined from afar, the beginnings of the love drama appear positive, and perhaps within the normal range of human experience. But when delving deeper into the dynamics of the love match, I noticed that the experience held a greater degree of a magical reality. If you scroll back up to the list of characteristics Lorgan mentioned, I can answer a yes to most points she mentions in my experiences. They all manifested in different ways and in varying degrees in each relationship. Of course I need to look within myself and at my part an issue of why I attracted these kind of women and re relationships into my life and why I was attracted to them, my own blind spots, wounds and wishful thinking which these entities target, while I was ignoring all the red flags that were present at the beginning and throughout the relationships. As I said before, this is not about blaming or taking slash making things personal. Knowledge, awareness and taking responsibility for one's own healing process and self-work are key. A red flag is an internal warning system that goes off when something feels off. Many who experienced a paranormally influenced love relationship realized their red flag warning signs only in hindsight. Some signs were subtle feelings of something being not quite right, while others were more overt, such as nightmares and psychic warnings in the form of dreams or visions. Some people reported very physical warning sensations such as restlessness, stomach cramps, changes in appetite, jaw pain, and headaches. Others noticed mental or emotional symptoms such as anxiety or edginess. When a child grows up associating verbal physically and slash or emotionally abuse and other dangers as normal, their red flags become repressed or ignored. Adults who were abused or emotionally deprived as children are less likely to respond to red flags. Yet, it is possible for them to recover their awareness of these physical reactions by paying close attention to their feelings and actively working to heal their traumas. Doing it alone usually doesn't work. It is much more helpful to find a compassionate person to hear and understand us, someone who can help us become aware of our own blind spots. In the long run, Isolation only creates more problems. Regarding paranormal interference in our lives, the widespread lack of awareness is not only the result of trauma or some walled-off, unhealed psychic wound. It is usually more about our social conditioning or even, as I have found, outright censorship of such things as UFOs, extraterrestrials, mind control experimentation, ancient scriptures or indigenous traditions which warn humanity about spiritual warfare. Many, if not most, of the people who came to me with their love bite relationship were sensitive, intuitive individuals. Yet this did not always work in their favor when it came to red flag warning systems. I believe this indicates that we are dealing with something much more than a simple toxic relationship issue, easily explained by contemporary pop psychology. The dark side of Cupid is real. Open discussion about it is important. We need to take global responsibility for growing in spiritual discernment and stepping it up a notch in the emotional intelligence department. We need to become aware of the specific red flags that often accompany the dark side of Cupid. These are indicators of an unseen interference factor. They may include paranormal activity, emotional tension, inability to consummate the love obsession, euphoric highs and crashing lows, mental changes like obsession, shifts in lifestyle and values, and energy drainage, either emotional or physical. These red flags are not necessarily in response to the love partner, but can be from the general atmosphere of the relationship itself, as if it were being arranged by an intelligent force behind the curtain. One must be mindful not to blame the partner when the dark side of Cupid hits, because there are other factors at work. More often than not, the red flags are recognized only in hindsight, after the love relationship gets going or even after it ends. The biggest obstacle to recognizing them in time is a simple lack of knowledge. Red flags in the dark side of Cupid cases. Dreams of the partner before meeting them, suggesting something precognitive. Physical sensations in the solar plexus, genital, gut or other body areas, such as neck, heart and between the shoulders. Astral sex visitations and slash or telesthesia sensing the energy body in a sexual way and very physically as if another being were present but invisible. Strong psychic connection, even though you may not really love your partner. Powerful sexual passion and obsessive need to have sex, even in cases in which you don't love the partner or they don't love you and slash or are abusive. Psychic responses and coincidences from either partner, like receiving a phone call or email from your partner the moment you think about cutting off the connection. A sense of emotional or physical draining. One partner becoming suddenly switched off emotionally or psychically unplugged. Feelings of being watched or being played like puppets in some drama myth. Paranormal activity, third-party entity visits or attacks, sudden dreams, visions and thoughts as if implanted. Obsessive thoughts that are not usual for either partner. Synchronicities, omens, and a feeling of being in a magical reality. Many of those red flags I did notice before and during those relationships, but even more so in hindsight. The biggest reason why I didn't act on those red flags was because I didn't trust those hunches and deeper knowing. Oftentimes I just rationalized them all away or believing that I was projecting or afraid of intimacy or of being in a relationship or I took on their projections, feeling I'm not being loving or affectionate enough. Sometimes we actually can trust our first hunches before projections kick in. Many times I felt bodily sensations and especially in my solar plexus that something won't be right, 
but even those impressions I ignored or rationalized away. It is important to understand that these entities, aliens, hyperdimensional overlords, or whatever you want to call them target specifically our personal blind spots, wounds, and wishful thinking. These love bites and interferences then manifest in various issues and relationship dynamics psychologically. The most basic example would be targeting our unfulfilled childhood needs which become even more heightened and we then unconsciously try to get from a partner those needs or even attract a partner unconsciously based on those unfulfilled needs. Everyone in our society is narcissistically wounded in varying degrees. It comes with growing up in a sick society where pathological characteristics have become normalized and also because no parents or caretakers are perfect. Being narcissistically wounded, not to confuse with narcissistic personality disorder NPD, is nothing to be ashamed or bad of as long as we check ourselves. Don't justify slash rationalize our narcissistic tendencies, show humility, engage in sincere self-work and catch ourselves when we try to get needs based on our childhood wounding, trying to feed off the attention of others, because mom slash dad didn't give much attention, be it through pictures we post of ourselves or any posts we make on social media outlets, consciously or not, or through other means, be it in everyday life through the clothes we wear, how we try to impress others, how much time we spend in front of the mirror, or check ourselves out in store windows as we pass by shops seek attention from others, etc., etc. Velvet Italy October 2012 Narcissism in our society has become deeply ingrained, especially in the younger generation and kids who have grown up right during the internet boom of the 90s, unconsciously affected by social media and the internet with many of them having become addicted to selfies and constantly sharing pictures of themselves. This is the process of the polarization of society, where pathological behaviors have become normalized and are even encouraged hiding behind polarized ideas of artistic expression, spirituality, or self-love. When something or someone has become polarized in its strictest sense, it means that the person or group can no longer make the distinction between healthy and pathological thought processes and logic. One is no longer able to draw a line between correct thinking and deviate thinking. We are currently in the midst of the greatest epidemic sickness known to humanity. Like a fish in water who doesn't recognize water because it is everywhere, both outside and within the fish itself, many of us don't realize the collective insanity in our midst as our madness is so pervasive that it has become normalized. People taken over by the Weedico virus usually don't suspect a thing about how they have been conned, or more accurately, how they have conned themselves. The Weedico culture offers no incentive for them to self-reflectingly speculate upon their increasingly depraved condition, on the contrary, the non-local field configures itself to enable, further cultivate, and deepen their psychosis. When someone is a full-blown, unrecognized Weedico, the field around them torques so as to protect, collude with, and feed into their psychosis in a way that entrances those around them. Similar to how an octopus squirts ink in order to hide, a psychic field gets conjured up around full-blown Weedicos which obfuscates their malfeasance. Once under the Weedico spell, people lose the capacity to recognize the Weedico pathology in others. In a situation of group narcissism, Weedicos at different stages of the disease assume particular postures and roles relative to each other that protect and shield themselves from their own insanity and darkness. They feed and reinforce each other's narcissism because it enhances their own. Anyone who doesn't buy into the arbitrarily established story is marginalized and demonized, and called either crazy, a conspiracy theorist, or even a terrorist. Such a group consensus about the nature of reality gets increasingly hard to sustain as time passes, however, as, like a house of cards ready to collapse at any moment, its vision of the world is based on the fundamental error of not being true. Strangely enough, people under the collective enchantment of Weedico become fanatically attached to supporting an agenda that oftentimes is diametrically opposed to serving their own best interests. This is an outer behavioral reflection of the inner state of being under the sway of the self-destructive Weedico parasite. All of the mainstream, culturally sanctioned, corporatized institutions are in the business of indoctrination, telling us what to think and not think, as well as how to think. Our mind is continually being massaged into shape by the prevailing culture, our true face lifted as our spiritual pockets are picked. Our civilization has become the mouthpiece for the propaganda organ of the disease, entrancing us to buy into its viewpoint as we are bled to death of what really counts. The culture that informs and forms around Weedico illness is itself a channel of its transmission and growth. If we sign on the dotted line and subscribe to its viewpoint, its life-denying culture will gradually subsume us into itself, enlisting us as its agents who unwittingly do its bidding. This is how the ever-expanding, self-generating psychic empire of collective psychosis works, as it increasingly takes over and approaches full employment. We are truly in a war. It is not the war we imagine we are in, which is the way our true adversaries want it. It is ultimately and actually not a foreign war against a foreign enemy. It is a war on consciousness, a war on our own minds. Paul Levy, Dispelling Weedico Breaking the Curse of Evil There is a difference between healthy self-love and self-expression as opposed to narcissism and sometimes the lines are blurry for we all have the immense ability to lie to ourselves and rationalize our behaviors. There are also other pathologies many people are dealing with and are not aware like the dance between a CO-dependent and narcissist, for example, 
who attract each other based on trauma bonding. I certainly can see how my own codependency issues have attracted narcissistic women. Trauma bonding happens when two people are attracted to each other because of their unconscious wounds mistaking that is love. In fact, much of what we call psychological issues or defects may be the just the symptom slash manifestation of a spirit attachment or alien interference. Shamanic cultures were very aware of hyperdimensional interference in malevolent spirits who would attach to people, their energy body and aura, creating physical and psychological disease and illness. Through emotional manipulation and psychic attacks, targeting our blind spots, these entities implant the love bite, intensifying our sexual and emotional desires to be with the other person which silences our inner knowing and keeps us from detecting and acting on those red flags. This is then even more emphasized through creating synchronicities and all kinds of magical events that make it seem that this is meant to be, linking two partners psychically. Distance is irrelevant because these beings exist outside our 3D concept of space and time. In fact most of the dark cupid cases Lorgan investigated started off as long distance relationship. I think the reason for that is that it creates more drama and emotional turmoil when both partners try to meet each other in person and the yearning is more intensified, leading to irrational decisions and complicated situations. That has certainly been my experience anyway. My personal blind spots were very clear to me in retrospect. Even though I have done a lot of self-work over the years and know my childhood wounds, there have been other issues I haven't fully realized. Plus I'm always a work in process and the learning never stops. Being comfortable in my solitude I was never desperate for a relationship but enjoy being single for most part. I never get bored and seldom feel lonely. However, a part of me definitely is yearning to be with a partner, someone who is on the same page and I can connect with on all levels, emotionally, physically, and intellectually. Obviously that is what everyone wants on some level. However, in a sense it's easier to be in a relationship when both partners are plugged into the matrix, not questioning anything but going along with the program with socially and culturally conditioned desires and goals. In my case and for may others as well, love relationships became way more difficult once you are in the process of seeking truth and have done so for a long time, engaged in deeper self-work and actively speak out about topics which the majority of people ignore, laugh about or ridicule. It can be a very lonely road at times where it is even hard to find good friends with whom you can share all this and be truly yourself and who are also engaged in the same work and process sincerely. The hook for me was that I thought these women were sincerely interested in the same topics based on what they told me when we first met and also a very strong sexual slash sensual attraction. Later on it became very clear that their words and behaviors didn't match their actions. Moreover, I also realized that just because someone has read or watched something, it doesn't mean that he slash she understood it, especially when applying it to themselves. My assumptions resulted then in projecting into them, not seeing clearly where they are actually at and expecting too much of them, not being externally considerate. It was just my desperate attempt to get them on the same page and sometimes I gave without being asked. Or that the asking is not sincere. These terms, Service to others and service to self are inextricably mixed up with the idea of love. On an individual basis, we may say that we love this or that person, and want to serve them, but then the question arises, which part of them are we serving? The higher part that seeks spiritual growth and union with God, or the lower part that seeks survival in the flesh? When we help someone who keeps making the same mistakes over and over again, we are clearly interfering in their lessons. What, then, are we serving? Most likely ourselves because we are then able to feel good that we are so long-suffering and patient and self-sacrificing, because we can certainly see, from the evidence of our eyes, that the other person isn't making any progress by virtue of our efforts. And, it may be a far more difficult thing to deny assistance, to refuse association with them, particularly when it is someone we love, because it hurts us to see them hurt. Yet, that may be the very thing needed in order for them to grow to be left to their own suffering until they have had enough so that they will begin to see their own way out of the difficulty thereby building soul strength and accessing their own powers and inner potentials. But, we run into a problem of judgment here, aren't we judging whether the person is really asking from the soul level or the level of the flesh? And, can't we be wrong? How do we know when our giving is violating another's free will? Well, we do have a little bit of a clue in many ancient teachings about asking. The stories say, ask and you shall receive. But, if you study this idea, you find that what they really say is ask and keep on asking, and it shall be given you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you shall find, knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. There are a number of Jesus parables that illustrate this point, particularly the friend at midnight, found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 5-13. The same teaching is standard procedure among the yogis of India and Tibet. A sufficient effort must be made by the supplicant before a response is made. In some cases, it takes years of asking. So. A good general rule to follow is that true asking is accompanied by sincere effort on the part of the one asking, and they must have done all that is in their power to achieve that for which they are asking. And so we began to learn that sometimes, serving others, in the human sense of the word, is merely the serving of the STS part of the person, the third density aspect of the flesh, 
and is not true stow in the sense of achieving higher balance. Another aspect that needs to be understood is this, in third density, we are all serving self in one way or another. We cannot, by our very nature of existence in the flesh that must consume to survive, be pure stow beings. That's the bottom line. And, it is in the understanding of this, the acceptance of it and then focusing on learning the lessons of this estate in which we find our being, becoming, at the very least, aware, and acting on that awareness to whatever extent possible, that we have the chance of becoming sto candidates. Laura Knight Jadchik, The Wave Volume 5 and 6 Petty Tyrants and Facing the Unknown My fault is also that I'm very giving and always give the person the benefit of a doubt even though the red flags are waving at me. I tend to overextend myself and give more than is coming back. Being empathetic by nature, always helping others I also have gotten myself into savior slash victim relationships resulting in very unbalanced dynamics and mistaking that is love. That's also why I tend to attract narcissistic women who need a lot of attention. They match my savior slash codependency tendencies. Many times I took this on myself which matches my childhood wounding of not being good enough and then attempt to give my partner what is actually not for me to give but what she needs to give herself and cannot expect from me or any partner. As mentioned before, the women I attracted were also very sexual, especially the last girl I've been with. This may sound like a nice problem for any man to deal with, but for me it always got confusing especially if no deeper platonic and emotional connection had been established before. In fact, for me it's been like the reverse of the cultural stereotype of women and men. In general men are usually more driven by sexual desires and don't really want to talk and share their emotions while most women want to create emotional intimacy first and tend to share more of their emotions. For me it was reversed in most relationships, as if I was playing out the cultural stereotype of a woman and the women were playing out the cultural stereotype of a man when it comes to sex and intimacy. The point is that we all have our inner feminine and masculine side which need to be brought into balance in a healthy way. True intimacy has also not all to do with physical affection and sex, but is more about emotional intimacy and relating. For many people physical affection and sex comes easier to them than emotional vulnerability and intelligence and being able to share this through verbal communication. More than anything I wanted to talk, establish a strong platonic connection and get to know each other first because too much sex at the beginning of a relationship without truly knowing the other person has always gotten me emotionally confused because a lot opens up when you have sex with someone. Initially, when we have this euphoric feeling of falling in love, there is a very strong erotic and lustful sexual attraction. We begin to have sexual fantasies about being with the person who evokes what we call chemistry. The unconscious pull towards a person can feel so intense that it's like a magnet. We desperately want to merge. It's compelling, fascinating, captivating, and enchanting to meet someone who evokes our god image. The passion is unbelievable. These are the scenes of grasping and groping at one another sexually that we see in movies. We are frantically pulling the other person's clothes off. The real motivation behind this, or should I say underneath all of this, is the urge to unite with ourselves. When we go through it with another human being, we experience this as blissful and heavenly but it is not the basis for a conscious relationship. It's only a short-term phenomenon. The relationship will have to have a stronger foundation than chemistry for it to have a chance to make it. Acquaintance friendship dating commitment, then sex is the order that I feel is important for a relationship. We can't skip any of these steps. When we are exploring friendship and dating, we find out a lot about the person. We may or may not want to continue into a committed situation. After being good friends and dating for a long period of time, only then are we ready to deal with commitment and sexual intimacy. Otherwise we are having sex with a stranger. When we prematurely become sexually intimate, this actually prevents us from getting to know people. Too much fear enters the situation. We start to come from a space of how we can feel secure in this situation instead of how we can get to know who this person is or whether we have a good partnership. When we are compulsively or magnetically drawn to anyone, it is inevitable that there is an element of projection. Rebecca Eigen Shadow Dance and the Astrological Seventh House Marriage, Partnership, and Open Enemies. The sexual attraction and intensity took me over as well at the beginning and acted on it without awareness. Getting lost in the romantic bliss with all the hormones rushing and I got involved deeply and fast, too fast. The love bite intensifies these desires even more. My big lesson in all of this is obviously to take my time to truly get to know the other person first and watch out for the red flags and not just act on all the emotional bliss, sexual passion, and romantic projections. That's easier said than done when this happens especially when a love bite slash dark cupid is involved. Being in the midst of a love bite slash dark side of cupid relationship and the leading up to it is hard to put into words or describe to someone who has never experienced anything like that. The outside observer may assume it all looks fine, like many friends told me about some of these relationships and how great we look together, but appearances and pictures can be very deceiving. When I shared what's actually going on and realized all the red flags even more, some of my friends couldn't understand why I don't just let it go in and be over and done with it. It's not that easy at all and takes a long time to recover, longer than any other normal relationships that had no signs of a love bite slash dark side of Cupid. Having said, 
a few very good friends who know about the topic of the dark side of Cupid and the topic of all topics saw right away what was going on and helped me a lot through it all, even encouraging me to write this blog to share my experiences so others can learn from it who can see similar characteristics in their relationships which defy any normal relationship dynamics and cannot be explained through basic psychology or spirituality alone. The topic of the abuse and distortion of sex and sexuality in our society is a subject on its own. I wanted to write about this subject more in depth in this blog as well, but considering how long this article already is I'll just address some points briefly. Sex and sexuality is highly distorted in our society. In fact humanity is screwed up sexually in so many ways we're not even aware of and the abuse of sex is widespread, not only in the obvious ways, such as pedophilia, rape, sexual harassment, porn, etc but predominantly in ways what most people consider normal or healthy sexual behaviors and desires with all kinds of kinks and fetishes. There is also a difference between true sexual play for fun and unconscious drives and behaviors based on sexual and emotional abuse, even violence, under the disguise of play. Interestingly, after thousands of years we still haven't gotten a deeper understanding of the mystery of sexual energy and its real power, creativity, and healing capabilities. We're not grasping the deeper effects, positive or negative, of how we use or abuse sex and sexual energy the effects it has on other realms of existence and multiverses and how other beings feed off it and work through us and how we are at times animated by forces we are not aware of at all so they can get at the juice. But of course this distortion and suppression of sexuality happened by design and is a major aspect of the matrix prison we're in. Our society is over-sexualized, bombarded with sexual images, especially in the entertainment industry, and sexually suppressed at the same time. The friction between those two extremes creates a lot of neurosis. For example, the popularity of Fifty Shades of Grey says a lot about our culture. Illuminati Slave There is the obvious guilt-ridden suppression of sexuality through dogmatic religion or the opposite side of the coin, the distorted approach to sexuality where anything goes, sometimes with a very superficial spiritual idea of sexuality that has more to do with hedonism. There are many so-called sexual healers and gurus who mask up their own pathology slash predatory nature as sexual healing and conscious sex. Psychological health and sexual health are deeply connected in ways most of us are not aware of. Wilhelm Reich, whose books were burned and who died in prison, was truly onto something when it comes to distorted sexual energy and how it affects society. Since our society has become very polarized, where pathological characteristics have become normalized, so have our ideas around sex and sexuality. Most people act mechanically on their sexual impulses and drives and just follow their sexual desires without discernment. I certainly have done so myself. Most of our social everyday life is based on unconscious feeding on sexual energy as Gurdjieff talked about in In Search of the Miraculous by P.D. Espinsky. Sex pl plays a tremendous role in maintaining the mechanicalness of life. Everything that people do is connected with sex, politics, religion, art, the theater, music, is all sex. Do you think people go to the theater or to church to pray or to see some new play? That is only for the sake of appearances. The principal thing in the theater as well as in church, is that there will be a lot of women or a lot of men. This is the center of gravity of all gatherings. What do you think brings people to cafes, to restaurants, to various fates? One thing only. Sex, it is the principal motive force of all mechanicalness. All sleep, all hypnosis, depends upon it. G.I. Gurdjieff. For example, we see many people posting sexy pics of themselves on social media with a conscious or unconscious attempt to feed off it or mask it up as art. However, what is actually feeding off that is the predator working through them. This also ties into the ever-rising epidemic of narcissism in this day and age as mentioned before where many people support each other's narcissistic tendencies because it has become so normalized. Most people don't know how narcissistic they actually are. What is distorted and suppressed usually comes out neurotically until we educate ourselves about what sexual energy truly is and how it affects us every day in ways we're not conscious of. Psychological health plays a major part in it. Like with any topic of deeper significance, there is disinformation and distorted ideas around the topic of sex. Spirituality has become distorted in today's conscious movements, and so has sexuality. Truth is mixed with lies and the discernment is even harder with a topic that affects all of us in ways most of us are not aware of. The temptation, no pun intended, to lie to oneself about it is even more heightened. Most people in the case studies of Eve Lorgan also reported that the sex was amazing and out of this world at the beginning, more intense than in other relationships. In those cases it also happened very fast and was extremely passionate, which I can relate to as well. However, a strong sexual connection is by no means a sign of true love or even compatibility in other ways. Something else needs to be considered as well. Within the sexual frequency, you exchange with one another. So if you are bonding yourself and chemically exchanging with a person who is not of your likeness, you are taking on their garbage because you are exchanging energy quite intimately. Even if you don't want to be with this person, the sexual experience stays with you because you have had an electromagnetic exchange. Barbara Marciniak, Bringers of the Dawn
with the last girl I was sexually intimate with I definitely felt I took something on and something was working through her. The fact that I got sick twice and drained a lot energetically, especially after having had sex, were huge red flags, no STD involved. Several times I felt what Eve Lorgan reported from her case studies as well. In several of the cases, individuals reported feeling that their partner was some kind of conduit or host being overshadowed or temporarily possessed by another spirit. In the case of Wiz and Coral, Wiz experienced a twisting, contorting knot in his solar plexus area after having sex with Coral. As the relationship progressed, he became confused, exhausted, and depressed. Even after he and Coral broke up, Wiz continued to experience paranormal activity and unusual dreams, as if a dark force followed him around, sucking his energy. He reported this to me years after the relationship ended, and could feel a distinct energy draining sensation between his shoulder blades, as if an entity had become attached to the back of his heart chakra area. This often happened in conjunction with sexual astral attacks in which he believed his sexual energy was being siphoned by predatory interdimensional entities. What could be happening with the dark side of Cupid is an indirect form of psychic feeding. One partner tends to have the greater psychic vampire features, but instead of being a direct, consciously feeding vampire, the partner is used as a sort of portal for an interdimensional, parasitic entity. The dark Cupid is accessing the two lovers' energy through some kind of mediated energy transfer. The question may then be, is Cupid, or whomever is behind this mask, a psychic vampire? One of the disconcerting issues that Dixon brought up with deep psychic feeding or communion with a vampire is the permanent psychic link that will be maintained with the donor or unwitting partner. This powerful connection is often felt as true love for the one being fed upon. For the vampire, the partner may be nothing more than an energy fix or addiction. This may result in unrequited love for the unfortunate ones caught in the nest of psychic feeders, as unintentional as it may be. A hazardous byproduct of psychic vampire sexual feeding, is a powerful connection which feels like one's true love or soul mate. Hence, the counterfeit soulmate connection. As mentioned before and I want to make this clear again because it is very important. It is not about blaming the other person nor should anyone who might have to come to terms with that he slash she is acting as a portal or has taken on a spirit attachment take this personal either. I have been dealing with spirit attachments myself in the past. As Lorgan said, Psychic and emotional vampirism is a key feature, and yet the vampirism itself may be an indirect aspect of the relationship interference as opposed to being the sole fault of one partner, aka the energy vampire. In other words, the emotional draining effects of the relationship may be a result of one partner who acts as a portal or some sort of conduit for another entity, such as Dark Cupid. These red flags are not necessarily in response to the love partner, but can be from the general atmosphere of the relationship itself, as if it were being arranged by an intelligent force behind the curtain. One must be mindful not to blame the partner when the dark side of Cupid hits, because there are other factors at work. However, Bringing this topic up to a partner who may be dealing with a spirit attachment and slash or being a conduit for other entities is not easy at all for the predator mind in them will defend and rationalize it away or take it very personal where no objective discussion is possible. In fact, it may be the case that the entity is working through them in that instance, injecting thoughts, buffers, and defense mechanisms which they take as their own thoughts because it doesn't want to be exposed. Lorgan shared a couple of cases where it was possible for a couple to work through a dark side of Cupid setup since both partners were able to look at it objectively, not taking things personal made an effort to educate themselves about this topic and were actively engaged in self-work and relationship work. I want to appeal to your analytical mind, Don Juan said. Think for a moment, and tell me how you would explain the contradiction between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of beliefs, or the stupidity of his contradictory behavior. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of beliefs, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our hopes and expectations and dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetousness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predators who make us complacent, routinary, and egomaniacal. But how can they do this, Don Juan? I asked, somehow angered further by what he was saying. Do they whisper all that in our ears while we are asleep? No, they don't do it that way. That's idiotic, Don Juan said, smiling. They are infinitely more efficient and organized than that. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators engaged themselves in a stupendous maneuver stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist. A horrendous maneuver from the point of view of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. Do you hear me? The predators give us their mind, which becomes our mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. I know that even though you have never suffered hunger, you have food anxiety, which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which, after all, is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them. And they ensure, in this manner, a degree of security to act as a buffer against their fear. Carlos Castaneda, The Active Side of Infinity. 
687 underscore 11 underscore Bajik Jake The spirit attachment slash possession syndrome also relates to the love bite slash dark side of Cupid. Dr. William Baldwin has done extensive research around this topic. The condition of spirit possession, that is, full or partial takeover of a living human by a discarnate being, has been recognized or at least theorized in every era and every culture. In 90% of societies worldwide there are records of possession-like phenomena, Fawkes, 1985. Extensive contemporary clinical evidence suggests that discarnate beings, the spirits of deceased humans, can influence living people by forming a physical or mental connection or attachment, and subsequently imposing detrimental physical and slash or emotional conditions and symptoms. This condition has been called the possession state, possession disorder, spirit possession, or spirit attachment. Earthbound spirits, the surviving consciousness of deceased humans, are the most prevalent possessing, obsessing, or attaching entities to be found. The disembodied consciousness seems to attach itself and merge fully or partially with the subconscious mind of a living person, exerting some degree of influence on thought processes, emotions, behavior and the physical body. The entity becomes a parasite in the mind of the host. A victim of this condition can be totally amnesic about episodes of complete takeover. An attachment can be benevolent in nature, totally self-serving, malevolent in intention, or completely neutral. Attachment to any person may be completely random, even accidental. It can occur simply because of physical proximity to the dying person at the time of the death. In about half the cases encountered in clinical practice it is a random choice with no prior connection in this or any other incarnation. In the remainder some connection can be found, some unfinished business from this or another lifetime. Any mental or physical symptom or condition, strong emotion, repressed negative feeling, conscious or unconscious need can act like a magnet to attract a discarnate entity with the same or similar emotion, condition, need, or feeling. Anger and rage, fear and terror, sadness and grief, guilt, remorse, or feelings of the need for punishment can invite entities with similar feelings. Severe stress may cause susceptibility to the influence of an intrusive spirit. Altering the consciousness with alcohol or drugs, especially the hallucinogens, loosens one's external ego boundaries and opens the subconscious mind to infestation by discarnate beings. The same holds true for the use of strong analgesics and the anesthetic drugs necessary in surgery. A codeine tablet taken for the relief of pain of a dental extraction can sufficiently alter the consciousness to allow entry to a spirit. Physical intrusions such as surgery or blood transfusion can lead to an entity attachment. In the case of an organ transplant the spirit of the organ donor can literally follow the transplanted organ into the new body. Physical trauma from auto collision, accidental falls, beating, or any blow to the head can render a person vulnerable to an intrusive spirit. The openness and surrender during sexual intercourse can allow the exchange of attached entities between two people. Sexual abuse such as rape, incest, or molestation of any sort creates a vulnerability to spirit invasion. Violence during the sexual abuse increases the likelihood of intrusion by an opportunistic spirit. A spirit can be bound to the earth by the emotions and feelings connected with a sudden traumatic death. Anger, fear, jealousy, resentment, Guilt, remorse, even strong ties of love can interfere with the normal transition. Erroneous religious beliefs about the afterlife can prevent a spirit from moving into the light because the after-death experience does not coincide with false expectations or preconceived notions of the way it is supposed to be. Following death by drug overdose, a newly deceased spirit maintains a strong appetite for the drug, and this hunger cannot be satisfied in the non-physical realm. The being must experience the drug through the sensorium of a living person who uses the substance. This can only be accomplished through a parasitic attachment to the person. Many drug users are controlled by the attached spirit of a deceased drug addict. Spirit attachment does not require the permission of the host. This seems to be a violation of free will. It also appears to refute the popular notion that each person is totally responsible for creating his or her reality and that there are no victims. The apparent conflict here stems from the definitions of permission and free will choice. Ignorance and denial of the possibility of spirit interference is no defense against spirit attachment. Belief or lack of belief regarding the existence of intrusive entities has no bearing on the reality of these beings and their behavior. In denial and ignorance, most people do not refuse permission to these non-physical intruders. Individual sovereign beings have the right to deny any violation or intrusion by another being. With limited, if any, knowledge and distorted perceptions of the nature of the spirit world, the non-physical reality, many people leave themselves open and create their own vulnerability as part of creating their own reality. It is fashionable today among many New Age enthusiasts to attempt to channel some higher power, a spirit teacher or master who will use the voice mechanism of any willing person to speak words of wisdom. Some use the terminology for my highest good when calling for a spirit to channel through. This activity constitutes permission and welcome for a discarnate spirit. The identifiers such as master and teacher and qualifiers such as for my highest good will be claimed by the entities as personally valid identifications, qualities, or attributes. The host is usually unaware of the presence of attached spirits. The thoughts, desires, and behaviors of an attached entity are experienced as the person's own thoughts 
desires and behaviors. The thoughts, feelings, habits, and desires do not seem foreign if they have been present for a long time, even from childhood. This is a major factor in the widespread denial of the concept and lack of acceptance of the phenomena of discarnate interference and spirit attachment, obsession, or possession. In most cases, a person can only experience and acknowledge the reality of the condition after an attached entity has been released. The realization may come some months after a releasement session as the person suddenly notices the absence of a familiar attitude, desire, addiction, or behavior. The symptoms of spirit attachment can be very subtle. An attached spirit may be present without producing any noticeable symptoms. A living person can have dozens, even hundreds of attached spirits, as they occupy no physical space. They can attach to the aura or float within the aura outside the body. If any part of the body of the host has a physical weakness the earthbound can attach to that area because of a corresponding weakness or injury to the physical body of the spirit prior to death. A spirit can lodge in any of the chakras of the host, drawn by the particular energy of the chakra or by the physical structures of that level of the body. An attached entity can be associated with any emotional track of a living person such as anger, fear, sadness, or guilt. The emotional energy of the entity intensifies the expression of a specific emotion, often leading to inappropriate overreactions to ordinary life situations. The mental, emotional, and physical influence of an attached entity can alter the original path of karmic options and opportunities of the host. It can disrupt the planned lifeline by hastening death or prolonging life, thus interfering with any specific checkout point. An entity of the opposite gender can influence the sexual preference and gender orientation. An attached entity can influence the choice of marriage partners and the choice of a partner for an extramarital affair. Many areas of a person's life can be influenced by one or more attached entities. In short, Spirit attachment can interfere with any aspect of the life of the unsuspecting host. The symptoms of spirit attachment can be very subtle. An attached spirit may be present without producing any noticeable symptoms. Yet attached entities always exert some influence ranging from a minor energy drain to a major degree of control or interference. Complete possession and takeover can result in suppression of the original personality. The earthbound spirit does not replace the rightful spirit in the body in such a case, it just usurps control. An attached earthbound spirit cannot maintain life in a human body after the original spirit being has separated from the body in the transition of death. Path towards healing and protection from the dark side of Cupid. The obvious questions that come up are how can we prevent love bite slash dark side of Cupid relationships? How can we prevent psychic attacks and spirit attachments? How can we recover from them? The most important part is to gain knowledge about this topic. But knowledge alone is not enough. We need to understand and apply it. I realize that I understood many things intellectually in the past but my naivete and lack of awareness of my blind spots left me vulnerable to these attacks and set UPS. It's one thing to be attacked overtly through ad hominem attacks and ridicule which I've received a lot for my work over the years, speaking out about these topics and other subjects as well. I can handle those just fine. My blind spot and weakness were love relationships and these forces working through the women I attracted and was attracted to and also working through me in ways I wasn't aware of. I also trust my inner knowing, which was there like a distant voice and truly see all the red flags, seeing the unseen of what is happening underneath it all. It was clouded by romantic bliss and sexual ecstasy. All there is are lessons and even those entities that work through others to attack us or work through ourselves are in the end teachers, pointing to our issues and blind spots which they conveniently use to get to us. In a sense it's like a shamanic initiation, battling with demons within and without. That's why it is important not to fall into blame or making it a personal issue and project onto the partner. These love bite slash dark side of Cupid experiences, especially the last one, forced me to take a deeper look into myself even more and also truly understand how romance at the beginning of a relationship can be so deceiving with all the emotional high and fixation when our hormones go crazy. Trusting our intuition and inner knowing from the get-go is very important, resisting to act on our impulses, especially if there are out of proportion emotionally and sexually driven. Sexual chemistry and sexual intercourse itself is also a preferred method of creating a powerful link for psychic feeding. Eve Lorgan Alien Love Bite Most often we don't question our desires and impulses. We believe we know ourselves but mistake unfulfilled childhood needs as our true adult needs at times, mistaking the conditioned self for the true self. We also don't question our sexual fixations and desires at times and just act on them as they arise, assuming that this is just who we are and we just feel sexual or horny and hence just need to have sex or masturbate. For example, when I pointed out to the last girl I've been with that there is something off about her exaggerated need for physical affection slash sex and certain sexual kinks she was into, which didn't feel right to me, she said that this is just who she is, very sexual, and very affectionate. She even compared me to her past lovers with whom she never had such problems. Let alone the fact that it is very immature to compare your partner with past lovers, only one week into the relationship, which never helps when working though things, but many men and women are obviously into all kinds of things sexually and most of them never question them, especially in light of what Dr. Baldwin found out in his research into spirit attachments. 
The openness and surrender during sexual intercourse can allow the exchange of attached entities between two people. The thoughts, desires, and behaviors of an attached entity are experienced as the person's own thoughts, desires and behaviors. The thoughts, feelings, habits, and desires do not seem foreign if they have been present for a long time, even from childhood. This is a major factor in the widespread denial of the concept and lack of acceptance of the phenomena of discarnate interference and spirit attachment, obsession, or possession. Trying to explain to her that there are other ways to transmute sexual energy than just physically through sex or masturbation was met with a lot of defenses and she got triggered a lot. It's obviously not about denying our sexuality. It's not about this black and white thinking or falling into shame slash guilt for having certain desires or denying our natural biological sexual drives, but about truly understanding ourselves and where our desires actually come from and how we tend to use sex at times to avoid facing deeper emotional vulnerability and a more intimate connection with another person beyond the physical connection. As Eve Lorgan said, powerful sexual passion and obsessive need to have sex is one of the red flags in a dark side of Cupid love relationship. I certainly have experienced that in myself at times in a love-bite relationship hence I'm not taking myself out of the equation. Sex is beautiful and healing on many levels if used appropriately and with true love present. But as I said before, there is much more to be said about the topic of sex and sexuality. There is a reason why transmutation, not suppression, of sexual energy is big part of esoteric work in order to escape the matrix. All this information may create paranoia in some people. Considering the idea of hype dimensional forces attacking us and spirit attachments working through us and others opens up Pandora's box big time. But again, where there is knowledge, understanding, and awareness, there is no fear or paranoia, hence educating ourselves about this topic is crucial for there is more to reality than we can perceive and we're not on top of the food chain. The food for these beings is emotional turmoil and sexual energy plays a big part in it as well. This requires open-mindedness, questioning our long-held socially conditioned views of reality. How do we turn off the food supply for these beings? This goes back to what I mentioned before. Besides educating ourselves about this topic it really comes down to basic psychological work first and foremost. 10431142 underscore 10203792767767245 underscore 68524366597049664 underscore 01. One of the main things I learned through this process is that any individual who wishes to pursue esoteric studies ought to have a clean and fully functional and most of all healthy psyche before he goes wandering off into unknown realms. After all, if your psychological state is such that you cannot deal effectively with your everyday life, how can you possibly trust such a psychological state not to mislead you in studies where you have fewer solid landmarks or feedback mechanisms to guide you? And so, it strikes me that the very first order of business in any esoteric work is to get psychologically healthy. That's basically what the gurge of self-remembering and more of Eve introspection and castaneda recapitulation is all about. Sure. It can be referred to in nebulous ways such as the work of sorcerers and recapturing energy and crystallizing a soul and so on, but it can also be talked about in very practical, scientific, modern terminology with definite examples and techniques for accomplishing this important work of knowing your machine, cleaning and adjusting it so that it works properly, and preparing oneself for more interesting esoteric work. We have found that dealing with the issues of narcissism and psychopathology in our world is the clearest and most direct path to dealing with programs, buffers, or the predator's mind in man. Most human beings in the world are narcissistic and most of us are raised by narcissists. The world itself society, culture, science, religion is heavily influenced by psychopathic influences and these influences are one of the reasons that most potentially healthy people become narcissistic it is a defense a system of buffers. And so, as we are raised in a psychopathic slash narcissistic world, we also grow these buffers that separate us from our true self and that force our machine to use up vast quantities of soul energy just to keep running it all. And so, we approach the problem in a very pragmatic and practical way. A person can do nothing until they are psychologically healthy and this means removing buffers, mentally going over the machine in a careful and thorough way, cleaning it, rewiring it and most of all, having new experiences that help with this rewiring process in an environment where this is possible. Then, of course, you need to really understand how the world got to be the way it is, and that involves the study of psychopathy. Studying psychopathy is useful for another very good reason, when you finally clearly see the traits of the psychopath writ large, it helps you to identify traces of such influences in your own makeup. Psychopaths are like caricatures that help you recognize something by its most pronounced features, just like the drawing known as a caricature. Life is lessons. It's that simple. We pass these lessons by learning to see the hidden dynamics of our interpersonal relationships. Once we understand these dynamics we can learn to put an end to the destructive and emotionally draining ones. Therefore, the process of recapitulation is one of great importance. By having an understanding of our past mistakes we can apply our understanding in the present, thus protecting ourselves for the future. We can truly self-remember, as Gurdjieff says, and utilize the present for whatever aim we have set for ourselves. Laura Knight Jadchik, The Wave Volume 5 and 6 Petty Tyrants and Facing the Unknown
The more we are aware of our childhood wounds, possible trauma, sexual issues, blind spots, and actively work towards healing ourselves, the more we become objective with ourselves, without behaving mechanically and reactionary, the better we truly know ourselves. Know thyself. However, knowing thyself also implies knowing our weaknesses, buffers, and lies we are telling ourselves and may have for a very long time. This work cannot always be done alone for we need mirrors from others who see us at times better than we can see ourselves. Obviously it would help to have friends who are also engaged in sincere self-work, have basic understanding of psychology and are aware of the topic of all topics, otherwise our friends may just support our buffers in their well-meaning intent to make ourselves feel better. According to the great work, a friend is one in which you support and encourage the other's expansion in either the mind or the spirit. Otherwise they are people you are sentimentally attached to it because they would eat cinnamon bun with you. And they will say he, he, he aren't we having fun. Drug addicts do the same thing. Drug addicts want to be around people who will support them and be away from real friends. Do you know why? Because it feels good. To be a member of a mystery school can be catastrophic to the ego and to the ego's habits and to the propensity for mediocrity. No one ever cried striving for excellence. They only cried when their mediocrity was taken away from them and pointed out to them. Jerham. The most important part of that work is emotional intelligence and regulation. In various esoteric teachings emotions, sensations, feelings, and passions, are represented by horses with the master, true self, in the carriage, physical body, and the coachman is the ensemble of the intellectual faculties including reason. The horses need to be trained by the coachman so they don't drive us over the cliff. In other words, emotional intelligence is the ability to link our emotions to reason, connecting the heart and the mind and not letting one override the other. When discussing emotional intelligence, the intelligence component refers to the ability to apply reason to factual information. The emotional component is how we interact with others based on this information. An emotionally intelligent person uses both qualities in balance. In order to avoid attracting and feeding the paranormal virus as it attempts to infect the living cells of our love relationship, we must start with emotional clearing. Pent up emotions and unhealed wounds can cause tension, anger, and depression, and act as a magnetic attractor to more of the same. Once the awareness of unresolved emotions emerges, it is the responsibility of the more aware partner to address these issues. Developing emotional awareness and intelligence means being willing to be present with our feelings and needs respecting others and engaging in mindfulness practices. Tracking our behavior patterns, such as compulsions, addictions, and things that trigger us emotionally, is essential to expanding our awareness. It's part of raising our consciousness and evolving as human beings. Eve Lorgan In other words, we need to develop or connect to our objective observer, being able to step outside ourselves, not disassociating, not getting into our head, but staying grounded and embodied, observing what is actually happening and tapping into our reason and inner knowing, the master who can see knows which direction we need to go and can make the right decision. As we've already learned, the main thrust of the Stoics was that human beings should strive for rational control of moral action as defined by the rational as objective as possible understanding of the human constitution and cosmic design as related to humans. Posidonius explained a moral mistake as being due to a person being inadequately educated, either in rational understanding or life habits, who was ruled by his or her emotions. Such a person would give more value to objects of emotion and desire, drive which would cause them to so distort their rational thoughts that they ended up making a choice that actually overrode moral reason. Posidonius insisted that the root of evil or vicious action is internal, a seed lying in the natural pathology of our own makeup. He agreed that the seed could be nurtured and grown by external agencies, but in the end, right or wrong is our individual, personal responsibility. So, what to do? Posidonius had a very practical approach. He proposed that an individual should be trained along two pathways simultaneously. The first one was theoretical study of the natural world and the second was training by having moral rules that define appropriate acts to follow. Both courses of education were needed, one aimed at developing and strengthening the rational mind with knowledge and awareness, and the other directed at overcoming mental pathology, bad habits, wrong reactions, and overactive emotions. According to Posidonius, the rational aspect of a person was amenable to infusion of knowledge and training when he was sane. He could then be taught that he needed to follow, in everything, reason, which is similar to the rationality that infuses the cosmos and the way to find that out was to study the cosmos itself, that is the world and everything in it. One should understand fully and completely that it is a deviation from true humanness to be swept along by our irrational aspects like an animal. Thus, such a course of study would include natural philosophy and logic so as to come to an understanding of the structure and operation of the cosmos and our positive, responsible function within it, and from this to acknowledge that our rationality, not our emotional impulses, was our true directing force. In other words, etiology, the study of causation, should be one of our chief occupations. However, when the ordinary man is insane due to excessive emotionality, different training methods needed to be used since irrational states do not respond to rational discussion. It should be noted here that in no way did the Stoics think that eradicating emotions was proper. As Posidonius noted, 
they are a necessary part of our natural and normal mental makeup. But like a horse, they needed to be trained and not allowed to pull the carriage over a cliff. Seneca tells us that Posidonius elaborated a whole system of ethics for training and it included different methods of persuasion, exhortation, and many examples. Laura Nightjadchik, Comets, and the Horns of Moses. Without emotional intelligence we become easier targets of the dark cupid slash love bite. Emotional intelligence helps us also to become more discerning of who we engage with, especially intimately and sexually. The general law in life in the matrix. Let's explore a bit deeper why certain individuals are especially targeted with a love bite slash dark side of cupid as mentioned before. One common factor in each of my dark side of Cupid cases is that all the individuals were involved in the alternative research, paranormal, conspiracy, and slash or spirituality circles. In other words, all these people were part of a larger consciousness raising movement in the global community. Eve Lorgan. One thing up front. It's one thing to speak out and post articles slash videos on social media about what is really going on in our world here and there. That's great and necessary and helps to spread awareness. However, it's a whole different ball game when engaging into deeper research reading books, not just articles, listening to podcasts or watching YouTube videos, and actively seeking truth which requires time, work, and effort and then speaking out about it publicly through writing articles, books, giving talks or making videos with the potential of reaching a lot more people than just our immediate circle of friends. UFO researcher and historian Richard Dolan called people armchair researchers who just Google things, read some articles or watch videos and then claim to have knowledge and understanding of the topic matter. It takes much more to get at the truth than that. For example, Recently I have disabled the comment section for our film UFOs, Aliens, and the question of contact on YouTube. I've never seen so many trolls in one place with the vast majority of comments being completely off topic or downright vile. So much Bible thumping too. Sometimes I wonder if they mistakenly commented on a different video because it makes no sense what many of them write as if they have not seen the film at all, or they project so much nonsense into it that has nothing to do with what has been actually said and presented. It's a good example for the fact that just because someone watches something it doesn't mean that he slash she actually understood what had been said. Moreover, hardly anyone makes an effort to actually read slash study the resource list shown in the film and in the info section as well. Numerous times I've mentioned in the film and elsewhere how important it is to approach this topic carefully and do more research about it since this film is just an overview and only touches the tip of the iceberg. The same happens at times with the blogs I write. Many people don't check out the hyperlinks and listed resources which would help them to get a better understanding since all the articles on here even the very long ones like this one, are just a summary and overview of deep and complex topics. I offense. It's also one thing to speak out about general topics like GMOs, environmental issues, political issues like the illusion of the two-party paradigm, or choice through voting, the 9-11th sly, or even Zionism and questioning the official story of World War II which definitely attracts more attack and ridicule than the usual topics many progressive and liberal type people concern themselves with. Then there is of course the topic of genetic psychopathy and psychopaths in power, who, BTW, are the perfect vehicles for these hyperdimensional overlords slash aliens to work through, which causes a lot of resistance since most people believe all humans are born equal and are the same inside. It's important to speak out about the more obvious issues our world is facing since, unfortunately, it is still not that obvious to most people and sometimes you gotta reach people on that level before going straight into the fringe and deeper, hidden aspects of the matrix control system. However, what I have noticed in my life as well as in the life of others is that once you expose the topic of all topics and the hyperdimensional control slash manipulation of humanity, which is the root cause of the many other issues that are merely the symptoms, the control system goes into overdrive and attacks these people even more, mostly through others or directly through psychic attacks, or in the form of a love bite slash dark side of Cupid relationship. On a side note, I would never claim to be a researcher in the likes of the many amazing researchers and minds I quote and refer to often. I just connect the dots based on their their work, cross-reference them, and relate it to my own research, experiences, and insights. Many of those renegades and amazing researchers have suffered under severe attacks more than I ever have. Some of them were even killed or suicided. As I mentioned before, my life definitely changed big time once I got deeper into these topics and especially after releasing the UFO documentary when even one of the researchers presented in this film told us, just be aware that you will attract attack for putting this information out. For the most part those attacks happened in ways I did not expect at all, as though these forces knew exactly my blind spots and weaknesses, even though I was aware of the idea of hyperdimensional attack and interference since that is what the film and other writings were all about to begin with. It sounds contradictory since this knowledge should have protected me, right? Well, many times I was aware of attack coming through others who were not conscious of being used as a portal and I was able to protect myself, seeing the unseen, but when it came to love relationships my awareness was lacking at times for reasons mentioned before. Knowledge alone is not enough if we don't fully apply it at all times, stay aware and keep working on ourselves with all the impeccability and super efforts, Gurdjieff, necessary. 
We also need to a good network of truly like-minded friends who are engaged in the same work so we can be alarm clocks to each other and check each other's blind spots. The Cassiopeians say knowledge protects, and from their perspective, it is not knowledge until it is applied it is merely a collection of data and facts. And so we come to the idea that if a person is viewing this present situation we are discussing from a strictly human view, without considering the soul dynamics involved, then it certainly would seem to be merely a tempest in a teapot or a petty squabble or even a lack of harmony. From the human perspective, most of what occurs in interpersonal dynamical interactions is so judged. It is that very human judgment that we are being challenged to see through. The ordinary human interpretation that is generally put on such things is a mechanical reaction from the why can't we all just make nice and get along school of thought. And that is precisely what the matrix control system promotes. When you put the various pieces of the puzzle together, what you find is that the predator's mind, the hypnosis that Gurdjieff talked about, the matrix control system interface with our biocosmic computers, our bodies, is our DNA which is controlled and restricted by the generation of specific brain chemicals via the control of our emotions. This is what determines the way our brains and nervous systems are set up, which includes certain early periods of imprinting, which establishes our circuitry and thinking processes at an age and under conditions over which we have no control. And once those circuits are set up in a certain way, they can almost never be changed without a major meltdown, and they determine forever after how all incoming information is categorized. Indeed, we all have reptilian DNA. But we also have avian DNA. In fact, we are a veritable smorgasbord of DNA from all that exists around us. Nevertheless, something is going on that puts the reptilian DNA in control, and it is in that context that Don Juan means that the predator gave us his mind. Also, that these control programs, these chemicals of feeding, can be and are stimulated and perpetuated through our interactions with other human beings, most especially those closest to us, is a cold, hard fact of science. Each and every time the revelation of this control system is attempted, the matrix goes into overdrive to destroy it. And it is clear that this is the present situation, it is in seeing the unseen that we become aware of higher levels of being, it is in ordinary human interactions that we experience the battles between the forces of STS, service to self, and STO, service to others. And it is most definitely this factor that the matrix control system vigorously attempts to conceal. In other words, we are not just talking about a petty dispute, we are talking about a battle of forces at other levels, manifesting as always in human dynamics. Laura Nightjadchik the wave volume 5 and 6 petty tyrants and facing the unknown. The matrix control system relates to the general law as Boris Moraviev talked about in Gnosis and forces acting upon the seeker who tries to escape, the way, the matrix or reveals information about the truth of our situation. Economy of energies too is a must, as the walk to and on the way demands their total mobilization. Any unjustified expenditure can lead in the end to failure. We must always keep this in mind. In general, the reaction of those around towards someone who begins to search for the way is negative. This negative attitude is the result of the action of the general law, which, as we know, tends to keep man in his place. Not being able to do this directly by the action of illusion, the general law, when it loses its dominion over the man who moves, acts indirectly by the mediation of those around him. On the other hand, if someone just lives along without any efforts of waking up and seeking truth and is no threat to the general law or matrix control system, that also entails speaking out about issues that are not a real threat to the matrix or just distractions which ties into COINTELPRO distracting the seeker with pseudo-conspiracies, corrupted spiritual slash new age teachings and disinformation, he slash she will be left alone. He slash she can even make a brilliant career, be successful, have a family, kids, and be happy in the matrix reality without much struggle, yet he slash she will not have progressed esoterically being unconsciously under the influence of the general law following a influences of official culture and the status quo. We are not aware of how much we are bound by the action of the general law. Acting on us as it does on ourselves, this law immobilizes us or constantly tends to bring us back to our place. Its strength leaves us little freedom of action outside the limits of its direction and scope. It acts in various ways. One can say that if man lives like everyone else, if he does not venture off the beaten track, he will never perceive the existence of this force, or rather this force will ignore him. If man spends his life without distinguishing between A and B influences, he will end it as he started, one could say mechanically, driven by the law of accident. However, According to the nature and the intensity of the resultant forces to which he is subjected, it can happen to him to make a brilliant career, in the meaning the world gives to this expression. Yet he will come to the end of his days without having either learned or understood anything of reality. And earth returns to earth. That can be seen very clearly in our world. Most people who just goes along with the masses and accepted reality have not much struggle in the world. Birth, school, choose a career, get a job, watch TV, consume, reproduce, entertain be nationalistic or religious, follow your desires and impulses unexamined, etc. Not knowing himself, but a slave to the outside world, full on under the control of the general law slash matrix, the common man has no free will, although he thinks he does. 
However, whenever someone awakens, steps up and tries to escape the general law slash matrix by questioning what we've been taught and told, gaining knowledge and speaking out, forces are put onto him trying to to put him back in line, back to sleep. He will be ridiculed or even silenced. His only chance of protection is to apply knowledge and fuse the magnetic center through sincere self-work, so he doesn't fall back to sleep. Anything that is not a threat to the matrix control system or general law will be ignored or even promoted heavily, be it through religion, politics, entertainment, or popular new age slash spiritual ideas. But if his enterprises are out of the ordinary, no matter what field they are in, but especially in esotericism, this force begins to act, and stirs up all sorts of obstacles in order to bring him back to the point where according to the general law he must reside. Even without knowing this force, we have an intuition of its existence and of the many forms which clothe it. The holy scriptures speak of it more than once especially where esoteric work is concerned. Thus, if this conservative force, which is the servant of the general law, does not succeed in calming man by acting directly upon him, it tries to reach him indirectly through the people of his household, either through the feelings they invoke or the coolness and contempt they openly show him. Organic Portals This conservative force, the servant of the general law acts mostly through organic portals. Humans who are not aware, having no access to the higher centers or haven't built a strong eye and foundation are being used as portals through which the matrix works and unconsciously try to keep others from awakening through hyperdimensional forces, 40 STS, working through them. Think of Agent Smith being able to inject himself into any character in the film The Matrix trying to stop Neo from awakening. Hence, blind people, people who are asleep, plugged into the matrix, the grand illusion, become unconscious tools and puppets of the matrix to make sure no one jumps out of line. Organic portals are generic vehicles or portals, in human form open for use by a variety of forces, which is why they make excellent matrix puppets. It just so happens that they're being used now by 4D STS to control 3D STS slash 4D STO candidates through clapper and vampire functions keeping us locked into a behavioral pattern matching the orchestrated norm, and being physically close to us to sap our energies and keep us from having enough escape velocity to remove ourselves from the matrix control systems tug, via development of our magnetic centers. Thus we see that the natural function of the OP of imitation of the soul energy, the process by which they were able to progress and evolve, assumes a specific character with the STS development stream of collecting the soul energy of sold individuals in order to pass it along the feeding chain to 4D STS. The principal role of the OP is now to prevent the genuine seeker from advancing along the way. Laura Knight Jadchik, The Secret History of the World Red Dress Matrix Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? Morpheus, The Matrix We can see how this ties into love bite slash dark side of Cupid love relationships, not only to feed off the emotional turmoil but to set up one partner, who is involved in seeking truth and speaking out about the topics that expose the matrix control system, in order to divert and distract him slash her from the path. I can see how some women I was involved in mentioned before could have been organic portals since the primary talent of an OP is that of imitation, of mimicry as they steal energy from sold beings so as to emulate them. They also tend to be very focused on carnal love, based on the lower three centers and especially the sexual center. Of course all of this happens unconsciously. The pre-Adamic being, organic portal, is in his or her environment in a way that an Adamic being, sold individual, is not. The world with its A influences holds great attraction. The activity of the sexual center seeks gratification in a world more and more sexually charged through media and open displays of sexual imagery. The eye of the body can exist happily on the level of a basic animal existence governed by the lower centers, but the developing real eye in the process of activating the higher centers cannot. The topic of organic portals is deep and far-reaching. One must not to come to hasty conclusions, assumptions, or judgments. We all are organic portals to one degree or another as the predator and matrix works through all of us until we make the effort to gain, self, knowledge and work on fusing our centers that connect us to our higher self in a conscious way, dislodging our programs and conditioned, mechanical behaviors so we're able to use our will in a conscious and awake manner. That is the basis for true free will. Whether or not the individuals named are organic portals is not the issue. They may be sold individuals who have not yet been able to see behind the lie of the personality. As long as that has not happened, sold individuals will function and see the world and themselves as if they were organic portals. A major part of our esoteric work is to learn to extricate ourselves from the energy feeding dynamic inherent in relationships with organic portals. Moreover, because those who have the higher centers in potential are subject to the same programming and are mechanical, reaction units until they undertake the work to develop their higher centers, the same thing holds true in our interactions and dynamics with them. We are all feeders until we learn to stop our feeding off of others and how to stop others from feeding off of us. Esoteric work demands enormous amounts of energy, and this energy is the energy off of which others feed. In order to progress in esoteric work, it is fundamental to understand this underlying dynamic of feeding, it is pointless and dangerous to attempt to identify and to classify individuals as organic portals because we are all ops until we choose to be otherwise. 
To turn a tool for understanding the true terror of our situation in this world of the fallen into a weapon against individuals is to empty it of its spiritual importance and render it a tool of our enslavement in the material world, the same process that has occurred to all of the world's religions during the course of our unhappy history. A true understanding of the organic portal and the world in which we live gives us the knowledge necessary for getting out alive, whether that is literally or whether it is just being alive to our true nature as souls locked in material bodies in order to learn important lessons that only this world can teach. We can no more hate those who have no access to the higher truths because of who they are than we can hate the cat who plays with the mouse prior to killing and eating it. For a deeper and better understanding of this topic please read Organic Portal Soulless Humans and check out the resources and links within it. Wanderers Let's look at the love bite slash dark side of Cupid scenario in light of the idea of wanderers. Wanderers are individuals whose souls have incarnated from a higher density, fourth or sixth density, into this third density with a specific mission to accomplish in order to assist humanity helping with the harvest or graduation to fourth density during this age of transformation. However, due to the avail of forgetting when entering a lower density, the mission slash task by the wanderer is forgotten and he slash she needs to awaken to what they came here to do. Wanderers need to become conscious and aware of the traps, deceptions, and distractions in third density which may interfere with their mission since most people are not like them, but have a different inner wiring so to speak. R.A. mentions that the wanderer is less inclined to the deviousness of third density and therefore does not recognize as easily as a more negative individual would the negative nature of thoughts or beings. R.A. tells us that wanderers are vulnerable because they become completely the creature of third density in mind and body, and are, by nature, less inclined to deviousness and manipulation. For this reason, they often do not recognize as easily the negative nature of other beings or thoughts before they become involved with them. Then, very often, because of this very lack of perception of negativity, they often persist in relationships that are negative because they repeatedly attribute to the other person their own benevolent motives and perceptions. Additionally, there is just as much chance of negative hyperdimensional telepathic mind control influence being brought to bear on a wanderer as anyone else. The only difference occurs in what R.A. calls the spirit complex which, if it wishes, has an armor of light which enables it to recognize more clearly that which is not appropriately desired. This is not more than a bias, and cannot be called an understanding. So, in other words, you just have an instinct about things that are not right. But then, with all our be nice programming, we generally override the instinct and shove such signals under the rug or search endlessly for reasons to excuse bad behavior. RA and the CS both confirm that wanderers, however they are defined, are most definitely high priority targets of the Matrix controllers. Laura Nightjadchik, The Wave, Volume 2 Soul Hackers The Hidden Hands Behind the New Age Movement Wanderers are not only subject to hype dimensional manipulation in this Matrix control system as everyone else, but are primary targets of the 40 STS forces because their mission obviously interferes with the plans of the controllers of this world and they don't want this to happen. They don't want to lose their food source. Laura Nightjadchik makes an excellent analysis of this issue in Soul Hackers The Hidden Hands Behind the New Age Movement, The Wave Book 2, Chapter All There Is Is Lessons, or Wandering Around in Third Density Can Be Hazardous to Your Health. Here's a longer excerpt. The problem seems to be that of waking up of the wanderer to the nature of the mission and this present special problems. RA gives us several more clues. Wanderers become completely the creatures of third density in mind-slash-body complex. There is just as much chance of them being subjected to Orion STS mind programming attempts as to a mind slash body complex of strictly third density. The only difference occurs in the spirit complex which, if it wishes, has an armor of light, if you will, which enables it to recognize more clearly that which is not be desired by the mind slash body slash spirit complex. This is not more than a bias and cannot be called an understanding. So we begin to understand that even the purest of the pure are subject to corruption and deception. They do seem to have a bit of help in separating the wheat from the chaff but R.A. describes it as not more than a bias and cannot be called an understanding. The problem is, the bias often comes into direct conflict with the mind programming efforts of the Orion STS and a lot of suffering and torture can result. And there is also a special weakness of those who are configured to stow since they don't have meanness and deception in their own hearts, it can take almost forever for them to see it in others who are being used to keep them from awakening. R.A. remarks on this as well. Furthermore, the wanderer is less inclined to the deviousness of third density and therefore does not recognize as easily as a more negative individual would, the negative nature of thoughts or beings. If the wanderer is successfully co-opted by the Orion STS it would be caught into the planetary vibration and, when harvested, possibly repeat again the master cycle of third density as a planetary entity. R.A. also confirmed Don's remark that those with missions, wanderers, are high priority targets of the Orion STS faction. That's a scary thought. What it means is that if a person comes into incarnation from a higher density with a mission to serve, not only are they enveloped in the avail of forgetting, they become special targets for a bunch of intergalactic rapists and murderers who are only restrained in their actions by some sort of vague law of free will which still allows every imaginable trick and deception to be perpetrated on them so that they will engage in relationships, beliefs, actions, or reactions designed to bring them. 
down a few densities, so to speak. And they only get a bias toward what is truth, and not a clear understanding. So with all of this information we are trying to put together about what is out there just waiting to trap and deceive us, how in the world are we supposed to have a clue as to what is going on? Just who are the good guys here? In terms of stow contacts from the higher densities the infringement upon free will is greatly undesired. Therefore, those entities, which are wanderers upon your plane of illusion, will be the only subjects for the thought projections that make up the so-called close encounters and meetings. R.A. seems to be saying that only the wanderers have any hope of being in contact with the higher level good guys because they are, ipso facto, already of stow configuration and therefore, Contact is not an infringement upon their free will as it would be if the stow contact came to a third density being who has not yet graduated to the higher densities. Of course, they all look alike here on the big blue marble, and they are all mostly engaged in living relatively normal lives side by side with one another. And they do have to be awakened. Also, there is a special condition under which wanderers may be contacted, it seems, that pretty much eliminates your weekend seminar in channeling. It seems that there is an almost mathematical law involved in being able to communicate with higher density beings. If we just stop and think for a moment about the nature of most people on the planet who do not want to search or learn, they do not want to think or do the necessary work that prepares a vessel for the inflow of higher knowledge, they want to be saved with as little effort as possible, then you begin to understand the odds against contact with truly higher density stow beings. That is the operation of the law of free will. The majority of beings of third density are STS they would not be in this density otherwise. By this choice, they have also chosen the illusions that are part of this con job. Yes, at a very deep level, it is a choice to experience in order to learn, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. By the very fact that this is the choice of the majority, the few who might truly wish to perceive the truth are overruled by the mass choice according to the law of free will. Even if the being is a fourth or sixth density wanderer, by entering this density, they have chosen to play by the rules and cannot abridge them. R.A. did give us a figure, 65 million wanderers on the planet at the time he was speaking. That amounts to about one person out of every hundred on the planet. But how many of them survive the attacks? How many of them actually do, can, or will wake up? Particularly when we must expect them to be objects of special attention in terms of attack. So now we begin to understand the special traps set up for these wanderers wherein human agents are used to manipulate and control them. If they cannot be corrupted directly, the strategy is to corrupt those around them including family, friends, spouses, and associates of all kinds. There was a curious exchange with the Cassiopeians at one session which included another individual who also fits this profile that gives some clues as to how this occurs. May 3, 1997 Q.L., reading through the session of May 23, last year, when T.K. was also here, and the issue of his living in isolation from the rest of the world was addressed, you asked who had begged him to stay there even though he wanted to move to a place where he could have more contact with other people and more opportunities for growth and stimulation. The answer to this question was that it was his wife who insisted on remaining even though it was clear that he was unhappy in the environment. Then you made a remark about an M electromagnetic vector. The way I understood it is that you were saying that a person can be an M vector. Is that possible? A, vector means focuser of direction. Q, L, so his wife is the one who controls the focus of his direction. But how? Could that mean that a human being can vector M waves simply by their presence and that these M waves are part of the control system that manipulates people? Can it be that such agents are used as M vectors in the sense that they emanate a special frequency that literally affects the mind in terms of shutting down clarity, or even actually transmitting pre-coded thought loops? A. Precisely. Q, L, I also noticed that several of us have been involved with persons in relationships that seem designed to confuse, defuse, and otherwise distort our learning, as well as drain our energy. Basically, keeping us so stressed that we cannot fulfill our potential. Is there some significance to this observation? A, that is elementary, my dear knight. Q, L, were the individuals in our lives selected for the extremely subtle nature of their abilities to evoke pity? or were we programmed to respond to pity so that we were blind to something that was obvious to other people? A. Neither. You were selected to interact with those who would trigger a hypnotic response that would ultimately lead to a drain of energy. Q. T. Well, it is a fact, because my energy is sure drained. L. What is the purpose of this draining of energy? A. What do you think? Q. T. So you can't concentrate or do anything. You can't get anywhere with anything. A. Or at least not the important things. Q, T, is that why my concentration is so low? A, yes. You are dealing with a no-win situation. As you know. Q, T, so, if I don't get out, I will just keep going down. Is it the area or the person? A, both. One is wrapped within the other. Q, L, is it true that being in the presence of such people, that one is under the influence of an energy, an emanation from them physically, 
that befuddles the mind and makes it almost impossible to think one's way out of the situation? A. It is the draining of energy that befuddles the mind. Q. L. Where does this energy drain? A. Fourth density STS. Q. L. These people we are associated with drain our energy from us and fourth density STS harvests it from them? A. They do nothing. Fourth density STS does it all through them. Lesson number one, always expect attack. Lesson number two, know the modes of same. Lesson number three, know how to counteract same. When you are under attack, expect the unexpected, if it is going to cause problems. But, if you expect it, you learn how to head it off, thus neutralizing it. This is called vigilance, which is rooted in knowledge. And, what does knowledge do? Q, L, protects. I guess that a person just has to come to the full realization that virtually everything that happens on the planet no exceptions is a symbol of some interaction of STS versus STO energy at higher levels. A, yes, and for most, that is not as of yet realized. It must be part of a natural learning process. Q, L, well, I guess that all of us tend to keep one or another area sacrosanct and think that it is not subject to attack, or that we can use logic and third density thinking to explain it. Until a person realizes that attack can come through even oneself, wives, and husbands, Children and parents, friends virtually anybody nobody is exempt. A. The block is a lack of faith in the concept. Remember, when one has been indoctrinated by religion, culture, and slash or science, they are predisposed to view all things in the sense of the measurable physical reality exclusively. One must be cured of lack of faith in the reality of non-physical attack. One major thing we see from the above is that our associations can be crucial. Of course, if we are aware that anyone and everyone can be used as an M-vector to modulate our frequency or behavior or thinking, then we have some protection. But to be unaware of it, to be in close association with those who are unaware themselves, and therefore subject to this manipulation, is to be firmly in the trap. But suppose one person in a relationship begins to wake up, and becomes aware, even if only vaguely, that all is not as it seems. They will have continual glimpses of the reality, mostly when not in the presence of the other individual. They may clearly see that something is not working, that it is not right, and may even make decisions to change it or to leave. But the instant the other person is physically present with their M-vectoring capabilities, the glimpses of truth are damped or even shut down and the waking person begins to feel schizophrenic or crazy in some way for having such conflicting and opposing thoughts. Add to this the social and religious enculturation to turn the other cheek or suffer because it's noble and holy, and you have the recipe for cooking the wanderer's goose. Another of the factors in the control system is the self-destruct program. Obviously the aliens have no problem abducting and killing and eating many people who are still lost in the initial choice for STS slash third density. But there are the special cases of the wanderers who, obviously, the STS invaders don't want to tangle with at that level, as described above by R.A., so they have a rather clever way around this little stumbling block to their machinations, the suicide game. This is a very cunning setup, I can tell you. It can follow a variety of lines in the lives of different people, and it seems that the STS Orions take some sort of fiendish delight in designing variations for their entertainment pleasure, but the gist of it is this, a wanderer is born. Obviously they have to be born somewhere, to some family, with certain genetics. It is also equally obvious that the choices probably don't include having wanderers for parents or siblings, though there are exceptions. There they are, innocent little babies, volunteers for a great mission, surrounded by potential M-vectors and Lizzie agents. And the game begins. Abuse physical, sexual, and psychological comes into play to set them up for a later fall if in fact they are not just simply killed by same right at the beginning. But the special characteristic of the wanderer type is that they continue to shine with a sort of inner purity of the questing spirit even in the face of such treatment. As a result of this abuse, they can be attached by any number of dead dudes or elementals or even demonic type entities that enter in through wounds in the psychological slash psychic shield like cosmic bacteria. The usual next stage in this drama is to cause the wanderer to be attracted to a particular type of person who is a sort of false image of Stowe. This can be what researcher Eve Lorgan calls a love-bite relationship where a great cosmic love is simulated only to fall flat as soon as the M-vector is turned off. The intended result of this betrayal is to induce suicidal feelings or to set the wanderer up for the next variation of the game. What happens now is that the wanderer is set up by the previous dramas to seek out marriage or love partners who are also abusive either overtly or covertly. And, of course, the wanderer's special characteristics of being unable to really understand negative thinking because it is not a part of their own makeup, prevents them from seeing exactly what is going on. They always seem to attribute the same high motives and ideals to others that are in themselves. They endlessly excuse abuse and hurt to themselves and others with the idea that if they just love the other long enough, hard enough, pure enough, or stand by them through thick and thin, that the abuser will overcome their hurts slash wounds which are the cause of their abusive behavior, and they will then be able to be whole, which, of course, the wanderer believes to be a person similar to themselves. Gee, sounds like the way of the monk, doesn't it? 
Perhaps that way was created just to trap such positive individuals and to use them as energy food for STS. Then there is the constant projection of the suicide program by the many M-vectors that the wanderer finds in their environment. It takes careful observation to determine who these individuals may be, but it can be done. The natural feelings of being lost and alone and alienated from this environment are intensified and twisted so that the wanderer begins to focus solely upon the idea of getting out from under this enormous psychic pressure. Spirit attachments can also be used in this respect, attacking the wanderer from the inside, so to speak. April 15, 1995 Q. L. You have mentioned attack. Is this physical danger or just harassment danger? A. Mind attack for purpose of self-destruction. Q. L. Is there anything that can be done to shield against this kind of attack? A. Yes. Knowledge input on a continuous basis. Through it all, the wanderer never whines or complains that others are doing it to them, they always tend, first of all, to seek in themselves the cause of the events or the treatment they receive. They react with the idea that somehow they are not giving enough or in the right way, though they are entirely naive about what giving really is because, as mentioned, they have been brainwashed by the erroneous ideals of the third density STS environment which are manipulations to induce service to an illusion. With this enculturation, the most difficult thing that the wanderer has to face and do is to learn to not give in some instances, because this not giving is actually a form of giving at the soul level. End of excerpt. For an in-depth exploration of the topic of wanderers please read Wanderers, Purpose, an esoteric work in this time of transition to get a better understanding of this subject. Twin Soul Relationships and Polar Beings The question that comes up is how can we know when it is a true love slash soul mate connection and when is it a setup and foe slash counterfeit soul mate connection as Lorgan called it. Is there any hope for true love? Of course there is. However, people involved in seeking truth and doing the work to help raise consciousness and awareness, especially about topics that are far outside the mainstream and challenge the status quo, need to be extra aware when it comes to love relationships, making sure that their partner is collinear. That means to be truly on the same page and having a common unspoken understanding about the basics and a true foundation to build on. Most importantly both partners need to be engaged in sincere self-work and having done so for a significant time on their own before getting into a love relationship. 10665234 underscore 10204328440398726 underscore 4866999068075953888 underscore n. Psychotherapist David Rico suggests in his book How to Be an Adult in Relationships that both partners should have done at least 50% of self-work on their own before getting into a committed relationship. When do we know we have done 50% of our work? According to his definition, this is the state of awareness when we are able to recognize when triggers come up without reacting on them having developed the objective mindful observer and emotional intelligence to be able to work through issues as they come up without taking things personal and not getting lost in reactionary behavior. It also means being able to differentiate between unfulfilled childhood needs we cannot expect from a partner to fulfill as opposed to healthy adult needs based on our true self. Having said that, most often our wounds and unfulfilled childhood needs are being shown to us once we actually engage in an intimate love relationship and we weren't aware of on our own. In other words, relationships are lessons in love and not an end in themselves. So it goes both ways not jumping into relationships impulsively but also not isolating ourselves and avoiding relationships altogether. These lessons are different for each of us. Mindfulness is being an adult. It is unattainable for someone who lacks inner cohesion, personal continuity, and integration. Being a fair witness requires a healthy ego, because distance and objectivity are unavailable to someone with poor boundaries, no tolerance of ambiguity, and no sense of a personal center. The healthy ego is the part of us that can observe self, situations, and persons, assess them, and respond in such a way as to move towards our goals. It assists us in relationships by making us responsible and sensible in our choices and commitments. The neurotic ego, on the other hand, is the part of us that is compulsively driven or stymied by fear or desire, feeding arrogance, entitlement, attachment, and the need to control other people. Sometimes it is self-negating and makes us feel we are victims of others. This neurotic ego is the one we are meant to dismantle as our spiritual task in life. The neurotic ego wants to follow the path of least resistance. The spiritual self wants to reveal new paths. Childhood forces influence present choices, for the past is on a continuum with the present. Early business that is still unfinished does not have to be a sign of immaturity, rather, it can signal continuity. Recurrence of childhood themes in adult relationships gives our life depth in that we are not superficially passing over life events but inhabiting them fully as they evolve. Our past becomes a problem only when it leads to a compulsion to repeat our losses or smuggles unconscious determinants into our decisions. Our work, then, is not to abolish our connection to the past but to take it into account without being at its mercy. The question is how much the past interferes with our chances at healthy relating and living in accord with our deepest needs, values, and wishes. Every person needs the nourishment of food throughout life. Likewise, a psychologically healthy person needs the sustenance of the five A's attention, acceptance, appreciation, affection, and allowing. 
It is true that unmet needs for the five A's in childhood cannot be made up for later in life, in the sense that they cannot be fulfilled so absolutely, so immediately, or so unfailingly. That absolute, immediate fulfillment of needs by one person is appropriate only to infants. But needs can be fulfilled, in short or long-term installments, throughout life. The problem is not that we seek gratification but that we seek too much of it all at once. What we did not receive enough of before, we cannot receive enough of now. What we did receive enough of before, we can receive enough of now. We do not outgrow our early needs. Rather they become less overwhelming, and we find less primitive ways to fulfill them. For example, an infant may need to be cradled and carried, while an adult may be satisfied with a supportive remark and a kindly glance. Sometimes a lifelong need can be fulfilled by just such little moments of mindful love. David Rico, How to Be an Adult in Relationships Eve Lorgan defines a true twin-soul relationship as follow. The difference between a twin-soul relationship and a non-soulmate situation is that, in a good relationship, two people proceed in harmony, reconciling their conflicting views, but the twin-soul relationship is founded on a fundamental sense of oneness, oneness of vision, oneness of purpose, oneness of feeling. Twin souls do not pull their separate ways, except briefly and temporarily at the personality level. They progress as one, no longer hobbled by difference in pace or direction. This is the reason their advance is so swift once the connection has been made. In twin-soul relationships, both persons are usually on parallel spiritual paths or extended personal growth that reached a plateau where they were ready to meet their other half. There was no emotional manipulation or psychic vampirism at all. The connection between twin souls were nearly telepathic in some cases, but in ways that brought great satisfaction, harmony, and oneness of spiritual purpose in life. These people were spiritually focused and service-oriented. In the esoteric tradition the concept of polar beings relates to what is commonly called twin soul relationship nowadays. Moraviv writes in Gnosis about such a union. He also emphasizes the need for both partners having established the real eye and control over the lower impulses, especially the emotional and sexual center, before being able to recognize each other. He talks about that the necessity to move from carnal love based on the lower centers to courtly love and a strong platonic connection where both partners have done the necessary self-work to truly recognize each other based on the foundation of the real eye. What he describes below in esoteric language relates to what Rico and Lorgan talked about above and psychological self-work in general. Keep in mind that the term man relates to human and is not gender specific. Human love is imperfect because it is instinctive and impulsive. As long as man automatically follows his impulses, his love will serve only the cosmic goals of the ensemble the general law. The pleasure he always gains from this is as much an equilibrating element as a reward. As it is, it will not serve his esoteric evolution in any way. Yet love is the surest and most powerful means of achieving this evolution. This is because love is the one objective element in our lives. That objectivity remains true in all love's many aspects, and through all the variety of its manifestations. Love can, in effect, serve man in his esoteric evolution. However, to achieve this aim, man must apply conscious efforts to this love, not allow himself be led on by impulses. It can then be used to accelerate the growth of his personality and its progress towards the second birth, the first tangible result of esoteric practices. This work, done by man and woman working together, can develop with extraordinary power and give rapid results, on condition that from the esoteric point of view the two beings entirely suit each other, and also on condition that they are a perfect couple, that is, that their combination with reservations concerning the peculiarities of their human type reflects the relation between the Absolute I and the You before the creation of the universe. This is the case of those beings known in esoteric science as polar beings. We must add that now, at the threshold of the era of the Holy Spirit, where all that is wrong however well-intentioned must fall and break, the problem of the real polarity of couples becomes crucially important. Two beings, man and woman, who are supposed to be polar, cannot be absolutely certain of their polarity until later on, when they have reached the level of man four, on the threshold of level 5. This is because, although polar in essence, each of them brings with them a past that covers their real eye with a dissimilar crust. Those who are polar in essence must take this fact into account. It is only when they gradually shed this crust that the qualities of their essence will progressively shine through, bringing at each discovery an abundance of ineffable joy. Thus their love will always grow. Conscious personal efforts, especially efforts between two polar beings, and the joint efforts of people who have already progressed in the search for the way, mark out the route for those who want to serve who wish to be useful to the task of redemption which esoteric work wants to accomplish today in the whole world. To set out on the way, man must necessarily go through an inner collapse of the personality, what we call moral bankruptcy. Then he will know the vain illusion of pride, and the true value of humility. To return to this source, the chief practical objectives are mastery of the sexual center, and the training of the emotional center. However, for this esoteric work to be completed successfully by two people, it is essential that the two beings man and woman are integrally polar. Here the real eye is involved, and the couple's love, while containing all the possibilities already described in the preceding cases, 
has a singularly emotional character of a higher order. It naturally follows as this love is hylic, psychic, and spiritual at the same time, thus leading to an attraction that is visual, auditory, and tactile, it is incomparably richer. The chief characteristic of this so-called royal case is the bipolarity of the real I one for each couple. This orients their personalities and their bodies in such a way that what each hopes for and awaits from the other is precisely, and very naturally, what the other desires to and is prepared to offer. It is only in a case of this kind that there can be absolute harmony between a couple, and even this is conditional on each of them trying progressively to liquidate his or her karmic burden and to establish a balance between the lower centers, whose development must be pushed to the limit. These are the combined objectives which the allegedly polar couple who enter on the fifth way must seek through their work. This means that, right from the beginning, the knight and his lady-elect must practice courtly love, which unites in itself faith, hope and knowledge, gnosis, dot. Closing Thoughts the more we are seeking truth sincerely and speak out about it, the more attack we will receive in ways most of us are not aware of. As if relationships are not already hard enough for many people, they can become even more challenging for us who are involved in the alternative research, paranormal, conspiracy, and slash or spirituality circles, being part of a larger consciousness raising movement in the global community. Does that mean it is a lost cause? No, as mentioned at the beginning, we have to understand that we are more powerful than we think we are. It's a spiritual war and our weapons to defend and protect ourselves are knowledge and awareness. In fact, the deception lies in these entities making us believe that we are powerless and that we can't do anything about it. We can look at it in a different way. The fact that you are being attacked and attract that kind of attention shows that you are onto something that is a threat to the matrix control system, be it through the information you share of for who you simply are and what you are here to do but haven't realized yet. It can show you that you are actually on the right track. Struggle and suffering is inevitable on the path. The New Age has corrupted this as well with the very distorted idea of you create your own reality, blaming you for your own misfortunes. Yes, at times we do put ourselves into unfortunate situation based on, on our blind spots and unconscious behaviors but there is way more to the story as we have explored in this blog. At the same time we do need to be careful not to attract the attacks of the general law slash matrix control system unnecessarily. Strategic enclosure and external consideration is important in that regard. We cannot wake up others by force nor can we give when it is not asked for. Blind revolution without sincere self-work and gaining knowledge will make you that which you fight against, the trap of the reactionary revolutionary mind which is only focused on the outside world of our 3D reality, fighting the shadows on the wall. Matrix Neo stops bullets wallpaper. The path of the wanderer, renegade, or warrior to bring the light by making the darkness conscious is not an easy path by far. There are many traps, temptations, and distractions that can steer us away from what we are here to do and one of the most vulnerable points for many of us are love relationships. Understanding the topic of the alien love bite slash dark side of Cupid is essential knowledge for anyone on that path. Isn't it interesting, as we all focus on global issues such as the environment, government corruption, the fake war on terror, economy, the banking system, etc., all important topics that need to be addressed and looked at, but all along there seems to be something else going which many people are not aware of, ignore, deny, even laugh about or try to explain away with questionable spiritual concepts or mainstream psychology. If anything, the so-called New Age movement has been so heavily inculcated with the idea that one must not ever think about negative things, that they, above all other people, are most subject to the predations of higher realms. If you don't know about something, you cannot defend yourself against it. The consistent deflection from the truth of the state of so-called higher realms by masses of published material over the many years, suggests almost a program of disinformation. It was beginning to look as though there was something or someone out there who didn't want us to know something. Laura Nightjadchik it is also important to keep in mind that not everyone is suited for this path nor is it their calling, hence we need to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves as the esoteric axiom states, yet not shying away to give the lie what it deserves, the truth and that entails calling a spade a spade at times and not let our make nice program dampen our inner voice and knowing. This may sound all a bit depressing but in the end we're all in this together, all of us who answer the call. We're all teachers and students alike, but we also have different lessons to learn and integrate on an individual basis. We need to assist each other in this time of transition and do the best we can to move from service to self to service to others, create community, and be around like-minded people. If you can't be truly yourself with the people you are hanging out with, then you may want to ask yourself, what does true friendship really mean if you can't be yourself? On the path towards awakening and seeking truth people and long-time friends might fall out of one's life to make room for new ones to enter. That is a normal process. As we change inside, the outer changes as well. It can get lonely at times and confusing but there are assisting forces all around, even if we can't see them. After all the truth will set us free even if the process is a challenging at times. Whatever happens in the world and in our lives, we must be careful not to get stuck in a frequency of fear or negative emotions, for that is what these hyperdimensional overlords would like to see happen on this planet, using all kinds of deceptions and mind control techniques to keep us away from our true self and knowledge.
from true love and understanding. Our path to, self, knowledge and truth is the biggest threat to the ones wanting to control humanity for their own good. Hence, don't expect this to be a smooth ride. The importance of sincere self-work and gaining knowledge in order to vibrate on a higher frequency of true love in this time and age is obvious and self-evident when looking at the state of the world. We are in a spiritual warfare and the war is being fought through us. I leave you with the words of Eve Lorgan. After two decades of researching anomalous trauma, and more recently what I call love bite relationships, I have concluded that the paranormal factor is very real and we must deal with it. The problem with paranormal complications lies in the fact that not all individuals can perceive what is happening on more subtle levels of reality let alone understand it. Even in regular relationships we have misunderstandings, where one partner perceives something of which the other is unaware, and this may become a flashpoint of contention. There are varying degrees of differences in perception, even day to day, and that is normal to deal with. What I'm talking about are widely divergent perceptions because one individual is essentially unaware of their own internal process, emotional well-being, and spiritual identity. In the dark side of Cupid, perceptual variations are exacerbated because, for the majority of cases, one partner was more aware than the other when it came to seeing behind the facade of physical reality. There are two issues here that need addressing. One partner has a higher degree of awareness on subtle and emotional levels of reality, and slash or both partners disagree on what they are perceiving in situations that cause distress. An independent third-party entity, aka Cupid, demonic entities, or other paranormal viral factors, are interfering with the relationship to cause emotional trauma and suffering. Perceptual variations between two partners and disagreements thereof are one thing, but an assault on consciousness through deliberate orchestration of disharmonious love relationships is entirely a different matter. And this is the infectious culprit I believe we are dealing with. This is where paranormal intervention is needed. Let me explain my hypothesis simply. There is an assault on the raising of human consciousness in harmonious love relationships by a viral paranormal factor I have defined as the dark side of Cupid. Some may call it demonic, alien, artificial intelligence, or the ancient, mythical Cupid playing games. Why do I believe this? Because nearly all of my respondents who reported a dark side of Cupid relationship were actively involved in research of alternative media, spirituality, and slash or higher consciousness study. Some had reported extraterrestrial encounters and ghostly visitations. All were dissatisfied with what the mainstream media, educational system, orthodox religion, or politics told them. Why? Because their experiences and explorations of what was going on in their lives and in the world was not the same reality as what they were being told by mainstream establishment sources and global elite policy makers. The people who experienced the dark side of Cupid were not good little slaves with a hive mind. In my opinion, they were able to perceive things outside the box, and were actively engaged in activities which expand and redefine the outmoded herd mentality. I had to ask myself, is this an ancient war on the attempt to raise humanity's consciousness above the slave mentality? Spiritual warfare? Or is this simply a paranormal manifestation of parasitic soul energy vampirism? Maybe both. The only way we can approach this dilemma is to raise our own awareness to recognize that there is a problem so we can start dealing with it, and heal from it. We must set forth intervention strategies and proactive measures to create the relationships we want that will not feed the dark side of Cupid. I am reminded of a mother's wisdom, all peace in the world starts at the core of our love relationships and family. We must start here. I like to view the dark side of Cupid as an alien virus, a sociopathic parasite if you will. It is, I believe, the greatest test of human emotional and spiritual strength. It masquerades as all kinds of other diseases and can even look like the cure. In small doses, it won't be as noticeable and may even add some spice to the relationship. But in larger doses, it eventually kills the host, the love relationship itself. Paranormal intervention number one is to strengthen our own emotional and spiritual immune systems so that we are resistant to the virus. Our hearts, minds, and souls need cleansing on a regular basis. Even the most astute and spiritually dedicated people can be on the dark side of Cupid's hit list. In fact, I believe that people who are directed by a higher consciousness would be targeted by this kind of spiritual warfare. I don't think bad karma is entirely the problem, but many a new ager will quickly cast blame on the victim, implying that their difficulties arise because their intentions are not positive enough. I am often amazed at the lack of compassion displayed by many new age proponents when confronted by another's misfortunes, saying in effect, well you create your own reality. True insight healing and empowerment cannot take place in the face of blame, nor without compassion. Arrogance is not the answer and having a beginner's mind, as the Buddhists contend, is the first step to become free from suffering.